Thank you. Please be seated. All right, Mr. Bailiff, we can have the jurors brought in, please. All right, thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. All right, good morning, everyone. We're going back on the record on case CR 22211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. The state's continuing with its case in chief. I'll note that we do have our conduct order in effect in the courtroom and the remote viewing locations that prohibits the use of any electronic devices from transmitting any sounds, images, or videos during this trial. I would ask the public to please continue to comply with that order. I would also note all the jurors are here and accounted for, and I believe we've received the juror affirmation from all the jurors. Is that correct, Mr. Bailiff? Yes, Your Honor. All right. Thank you. And thank you again to the jurors for your continued service. When we left off yesterday, uh, Mr. Wood, you were conducting your direct examination, I believe, of uh, Agent Daniels, and I'll just briefly inquire as to Agent Daniels and ensure, uh, did you view any of the trial testimony in this case between uh, yesterday and today when you're testifying again? No, sir. Okay, thank you for that. <clears throat> uh, I'll remind you you're still under oath for your testimony, and Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue with your direct, you can. Thank you, Your Honor. <clears throat> Agent Daniels, uh, when we left off yesterday, I believe we had spoken about in this exhibit the house, the fire pit, uh, Tylee's burial site, and the garage and shed. Is that correct? That is correct. And I call your attention to the north portion of the map, uh, what's labeled as Site 1. Site one was what we called burial site number one, and that becomes the burial site for J.J. Ballow. Okay. And I, I believe we may have already started this, but uh, if you could just briefly 
remind the jury what we're looking at here. This was just a, what I would call an overall photo leading toward what became burial site number one. And burial site number one ends up being in the vicinity of where that laser pointer is. Okay. Um, and this is just kind of a, a showing you an overall of what the vegetation looked like, these the higher vege, higher level vegetation in that area, and then we'll gradually get closer to the site. Just, just one second, Your Honor. Can you briefly describe what's in photograph 149? This is just a photograph as we get closer now to burial site uh, number one. And this is the actual burial site here. So you can see the thicker vegetation, higher vegetation around the burial site. And then the actual burial site has the thinner layer of vegetation on top. And then when you're there in person, you can see that it was actually a, a little raised berm that, co that was the actual burial site. Okay. And I believe that we covered this photo yesterday and in this photo. Uh, Correct. Um, and just to refresh uh, everyone's memory, was this the preparation site or preparation of site one? Correct. And this was just kind of the, once we, once we decide this is, this looks like it could be a good burial, um, our process for these burials, and JJ's burial uh, was the first burial that we located on the property on June 9th. So our process, what we want to do when we process these burials or potential burials at this point, is we just want to kind of establish a perimeter for what we think that burial, where, where that burial is, and then we just want to start excavating or digging down. Um, and anything that becomes significant as we're digging down, the team leader will just make a determination, okay, that looks pretty significant, let's stop, let's take photographs, let's take some ferro scans of that layer, uh, just to document that for later, to try to tell the story of how <laughs> these remains were, were buried, whoever the suspect or suspects were that buried these human remains, we just wanna show that story down the road, uh, like a circumstance like this to a, to a jury. And so layer by layer, first we're taking that vegetation off, this potential burial. Your Honor, I'm going to object. He needs, there needs to be questions before we... <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll it's sustained. It is just a narrative. Okay. And I'd ask Mr. Wood and the witness, it does need to be an exchange of question and answer. Okay, thank you. Agent, I believe we saw this photo <coughs> yesterday, but if you could just briefly summarize again, just to refresh the jury's memory, what we're looking at in photo 173. So after we've removed that vegetation off the top, this is the next significant layer. So now the vegetation's gone, and now we can see those rocks that were protruding through the ground. And what's interesting now is just the precise way that these rocks are, are laid out. You can start to see the cut roots around this grave, especially the bigger roots. So somebody's taken time and effort to cut through these roots. And then you can start to see some board. Agent, to, to clarify, when you say someone has taken time to cut those roots, was it your team that cut those roots, or were they already cut? They were already cut. So our team did not cut these roots. So this is just how we found these roots uh, in this grave or burial site number one, as we called it at this time. And when we were there at this stage, we didn't know if this was burial site number one or, or if there would be human remains here, but this was a very good indication that somebody in, the, in this part of the field or property had deliberately placed these rocks that shouldn't belong there uh, in this precise manner. So it's a good indication that this is a burial at this time. And what, what did you observe in photo 181? So once the stones and rocks were removed from that last layer, this was the next layer. So underneath those stones, rock, there's two planks that were observed. And so that was a good point to stop, take more photos, and do some scans. And again, you can just see 
the same tree roots keep becoming exposed. Okay. Detective Agent, you've described the, these boards and, and these rocks. Uh, have you had, mm -hmm. through your work with ERT, uh, multiple experiences uh, discovering and uncovering clandestine graves? Yes. So through my experience, I've, I've probably excavated approximately five to seven burials. Um, out of all of those burials, this is probably, this is the most precise, um, somebody's taken the most effort to bury these remains. And what I mean by that is I haven't Agent, seen it. Oh, here, let me, let me ask the question, sorry. Agent, from your experience, um, you talked about the deliberateness of, of those items placed there. Was there anything else significant or uh, that stuck out to you about those items being placed there? So by placing these planks and rocks, a couple of things stuck out to me. And that would be, you would do that in order to prevent wildlife, potentially, from getting to your human remains. So if, if wildlife got to the human remains, they could then scatter those human remains. And if they scattered the human remains, then obviously a neighbor or somebody else could find those human remains. So then the grave's not as hidden as this, these people, person, would like them to be. Also, I had already described how this grave was found. There was like a raised berm. When human remains decompose, that usually means that if, if it had been level, there would be like a sinking of the soil once the human remains decompose. So somebody's put some thought into if the human remains decompose and there is like a sinking of that top layer, if there's a berm to it, then that will kind of level out over time. So in my experience tells me somebody's put some thought into preventing wildlife from getting to the human remains and also thinking about once those human remains decompose, not having such a, a depression in the soil from above. So trying to keep the remains hidden. Thank you. Agent, can you <clears throat> describe what what we see in photo 183. So now we've removed the planks and the teams continue to excavate further into the grave. And now we can see a, a black piece of plastic that starts to be exposed. Okay. And can you describe what we see in uh, photograph 190? And it's at, at this point is when I get into the burial and I take my hands and I just kind of brush aside the soil from the black uh, plastic. So I just kind of make an oval shape in the ground and that has the fill of a human skull. And that's what I presume it is. And at that point, I take a razor blade because we need to determine at this point we still don't know for sure if this is a burial and those are human remains. So we have to make that determination. So I take a razor blade and I cut into this black plastic bag. And that black plastic bag, as you can tell, it's, it's tight, sucked tight to whatever's inside. So I had to pull that black plastic bag off whatever was inside and then I make a razor blade cut to that black plastic bag trying not to disturb any forensic evidence that might be on it. Okay. So, Agent, can you describe what you see in photo 191? So underneath that black plastic bag, once it was cut open, ends up being this white plastic bag. And so I kind of do the same thing, kind of pull that white plastic bag away from what ends up being the skull, um, the head of the human remains. And I do the same thing, I make the a razor blade cut to that white plastic bag. And as I'm doing that cut, you can see kind of the human hair starts coming out, you know, with that razor blade into my hands. And that's the point that we decide that's, this is human remains. And so that, at that point, is when that absolutely becomes burial site number one. 
and that ends up becoming JJ, JJ's uh, burial site. And can you describe what you see in photograph 192? This is just a better picture showing the hair that came off with the razor blade. You can see the cut that was made to the white plastic. And then you can also see some duct tape that was also inside um, those plastic bags. Can you describe photograph 195? And then from that point, we know we have the human remains. This is a burial. So now the team just needs to continue excavation of the entire burial site so that we can remove the remains. Same process, just continue to excavate down um, until we can see the entire remains. Maybe there's other evidence in here also. So we're in this, this site, we, we talked about it before the other sites, but we did have a sifting operation uh, happening at this site too. We divided this uh, grave in half. So the top with the head was, set, was uh, grid A and the side with the feet was grid B. So we kind of sifted both areas, the dirt that was inside, just in case there was other evidence there. And in grid A, we had like a charcoal piece. We had a charcoal piece in B and there's a plastic piece found in grid A. So there's other things being done too with these with, within the burial. You can describe what's in photo 200. The, the teams just continue to excavate, so we're just getting a little bit deeper. Um, you know, we're getting further down in that excavation process. And then you can just kind of see that, you know, the roots are still there, so just things are showing up better. And what kind of tools was your team using at this point? So when we do these burials, we have, there's multiple tools depending on how far away you are from the human remains. Uh, we can, when we're further away from the human remains, we can use shovels, rakes to maybe get through some of those upper layers. Um, as we get closer to the human remains, depending on what they're inside of or wrapped in, we can use those trowels that I talked about before, which are metal. When we get closer to human remains, and these ones are wrapped, so it just kind of depends on who's excavating and what, what, what the soil's like. Soils are all different, but we have metal trowels. They're hand tools that you can hold, and they're kind of angular at the top. Um, we have wooden tools, um, so we like to use, if we get closer to um, flesh or organic material, we have wooden tools. We have uh, clay, uh, clay molding tools, so they're just little different shapes. So if you get closer to skin closer to flesh then sometimes those uh, clay type tools are useful or tongue depressors everybody knows what a tongue depressor is those are really good tools if you get closer to um, skeletal remains so you're not damaging skeletal remains so anyway, we have a we have a, a wide variety of tools we can use so it just depends on what, what we're facing in these different burials can you describe what you see in photograph 204. This is just kind of the continuation of the same, pro it's a slow methodical process. Um, if you've ever done one of these or um, we, we just take our time and we go slow because we don't want, you can see start seeing duct tape on the black plastic bag and for forensic people duct tape has really good evidence on it. So we, we go slow and methodical because we don't know what we're going to find like the duct tape so we try to preserve that. We don't want to hurt it. Um, and we don't know what else we're going to find. So we just kind of go really slow trying to, to find those key things and preserve those. Um, so just this is just keep, we just keep going down and maybe that duct tape, something just every so often we'll just, again, it's the team leader's discretion when we stop, take photographs um, and just try to, so, so when we're at this stage, just try to have these photos for, for everybody to review later. And can you tell us what you see in photograph 209? So now we're pretty much complete with the excavation of the human remains. And now we're ready to remove those remains. And what do you see in photo 215? So once those remains were removed, provided to the coroner, um, this just shows that there was decomposition that was leaking out of those plastic bags and is 
been left inside um, the burial. And then we did take samples of the of that decomposition. And then this and is what do you see in photo two one seven? This is just a close up of that decomposition that remained inside the burial. Can you describe what you see in photograph two four zero? This is just showing some of those uh, pieces of evidence or the rocks that were on top of the um, burial, that first one of the first layers, and then the planks that were on top of the burial. So some of those first layers that we had removed and then later took it took as evidence. And then all of the evidence from from this burial was provided to the Rexburg Police Department. And then the human remains were provided to the coroner. And can you describe what we see in photo 268? And then this was the first, again, this was the first burial that we found on the property. Um, and so at this time, it was really important that we went deeper after we found the remains and we did went wider after we found the remains because at this time we weren't positive. We were still looking for Tylee's remains. So now that we had found JJ's, we knew, hey, Tylee's around here somewhere. So it was super important that we used the tractor is she, is she buried, is Tylee buried underneath JJ? Is she somewhere in this vicinity? So we just had to use that tractor to try to see if, if, if Tylee was in this same area. So this was kind of the first time we used the backhoe to just kind of expand a little bit around where JJ was just in case. And did you find anything else in burial site one? We did not. Agent, you we we've spoken about feral scan data. <clears throat> was the feral scanner used at burial site one? It was. Um, you you spoke earlier about it being at the site supervis site supervisor's discretion as to when uh, to run the scanner. Uh, as the site supervisor, can you just? Explain a little further. What would make? What are the types of things that would lead you to uh, op have the feral scanner run? Just these uh, for a burial. Anything significant found with while you're doing the excavation. So key pieces of evidence. Um, in this case, you see a layer of rocks that are over a burial. You see the layer of planks over a burial. You know, when the, the, the second the, a black plastic bag shows up that, that could be the head, you know, that's, that's those key things you want to try to capture those, whether it's photos, scans. There's multiple way to cap, ways to capture those things. In this case, we chose to do the photos and the scans with the ferro scanner. Okay. So I'm going to show you what's been labeled layer A. And at this point, is there an approximate depth given? Yes, yeah, so this is just the, the photograph showing those rocks on the top on this layer. And then the lowest point of this layer, the approximate depth is listed in this lower diagram. And in layer B? So the lowest depth of the excavation from this photograph is just highlighted right here with that line. And again, you have in the diagram just from one foot, two foot, three foot. And layer C. And that depth is just kind of noted. The lowest depth from that picture is just kind of highlighted right there with C. Uh, and what do you describe, what can you describe for layer D? Just from this photograph where we were at at that time, the lowest depth that was scanned was right there, so just under a foot. Okay. And finally, in layer E. So this is when that excavation was complete. We were ready to remove the remains, and then the lowest layer scan depth that, that when that picture was taken 
was just above two feet. Your Honor, at this time I'm going to ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as Exhibits 170A through 170U. And I would, well, wait till he sees them. And the copy has been provided to counsel in the court. Agent, can you briefly review what's been provided to you in 170A through 170U and let me know when you've had a chance to review it? Okay. Do you recognize that exhibit? Yes. Uh, what does it purport to be? Uh, it looks like our ERT photos that were taken uh, June 9th and June 10th. And are okay. those, so there, are they the same photos that were used in your Intera exhibit? Interactive, yes. And are those true and accurate representations of what you observed on June 9th and 10th? Yes. Your Honor, the state moves for uh, Admission of State's Exhibits 170A through 170U into evidence. Any objection? Your Honor, um, <clears throat> may, I, may I have a here in aid of this objection? Yes. Uh, Agent Daniels, these photographs, each one of these photographs that are in this packet are also photographs that have been shown to you in this particular exhibit, is that correct? In the, in the exhibit that the PowerPoint exhibit? Correct. Okay. You know, my objection would be that it's cumulative evidence and that it, it's just not needed. All right, response, Mr. Wood. Thank you, Your Honor. The reason the state is putting these into evidence is for ease of the jury uh, in reviewing the evidence um, where this exhibit is interactive um, and they may not be familiar with it. It's just a simple uh, paper copy of the of the pictures, so it's just simply for the ease of the jury. All right. Well, I would note that Exhibit 171, which is the interactive exhibit, does have these photographs already within it. There's an objection made that it's cumulative. Um, I am considering that objection because the photographs are essentially all being proposed to be admitted to times, the same photographs. Um, 
However, given the nature of the different format and having considered whether or not there'd be any undue prejudice to have the paper copies of certain photographs, I'll find that it's not cumulative and it may assist the jury, would not be overly prejudicial. So I'll allow for the admission of exhibits 170A through 170U to be admitted. Then I next ask that the witness be handed States Exhibit 170V through 170QQ. Agent, can you review States Exhibits 170V through 170QQ and let me know when you've had a chance to review them? Yes. Okay, I've reviewed them. What is States Exhibit Exhibits 170V through 170QQ? There are photos that were in the interactive and photos that the ERT photographers took from the June 9th and 10th crime scene. Okay, and do you recognize those photographs? Yes. And are they true and accurate representations of what you witnessed on June 9th and 10th? Yes. Your Honor, for, again, for the ease of the jury, the State moves for admission of States Exhibits 170V through 170QQ. Any objection from the defense? Yes, Your Honor, we would renew our objection that these are cumulative. Okay. I've considered that objection. Again, it is more than one version of the same photograph being admitted. The court does find, upon weighing it out, that it would not be unduly prejudicial to have the jurors have an easier reference of these particular photos, which are also found in the interactive exhibit. So the court will overrule the cumulative objection. The photographs on those exhibits are admitted, and just so the record's clear, that would be V through 
Z, and then they start again <coughs> with AA, and then go sequentially AA, BB, etc., up through QQ. So those are the photographs that are now admitted. And if this witness could be handed state's exhibit 170 RR through 170 XX. Looks like there's two copies, is that right? Yeah, I accidentally handed you my copy as well. Okay. <laughs> Agent, can you review state's exhibits 170 RR through 170 XX? Yes. Agent, what, what is State's Exhibit 170RR through 170XX? They're photographs from the interactive. Okay. And what portion of the interactive exhibit are they the photographs of? They're from the house. Okay. And are they true and accurate representations of what you observed and witnessed on June 9th and June 10th of 2020? Yes, they are. Your Honor, the State moves for admission into evidence of 170 RR and through 170 XX. Any objection from the defense? Your Honor, the defense would object to these being cumulative. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. The courts again considered that objection. While these photographs are already incorporated into the interactive exhibit, I determined that they may be an alternative way for the jurors to more easily access the photographs and would not be unduly prejudicial so I'll overrule the cumulative objection and allow for the admission of exhibits RR uh, sequentially through XX. And then if the witness could be handed What's been marked as State's Exhibits 170YY through 170JJJ. Say that again. 170YY through 170JJJ. Agent, can you review State's Exhibits 170YY through 170JJJ and yes. let me know when you've had a chance to look at them?
Okay. Agent, what are, uh, what is in States Exhibit 170YY through 170JJJ? Photographs from the interactive. Okay. Uh, what portion of the interactive are they photographs of? Photographs from the fire pit. Okay. Uh, and are they true and accurate representations of what you observed and witnessed on uh, June 9th and 10th of 2020? Yes. Your Honor, the state moves for uh, to enter states exhibits 170 YY through 170 JJJ uh, into evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Same objection. We would object to it being cumulative. Very well. The court's considered that cumulative objection for the same reasons I've indicated in the previous three uh, rulings as to the nature of these photographs in relation to the interactive exhibit. I'll incorporate that same rationale and overrule the objection. So to be clear on the record then, exhibit YY and ZZ are admitted and then it begins with AAA and goes sequentially through JJJ and that packet of photos uh, is admitted over the objection. And then if the witness could be handed, States Exhibit 170 KKK through 170 WWW. Agent, can you review States Exhibits 170 KKK through 170 WWW and let me know when you've had a chance to look over them? Yes. Agent, what uh, have you had a chance to review States Exhibits 170 KKK through 170 WWW? Yes. Uh, what what do they purport to be? Photographs from the interactive. Okay. Um, and they're the same photographs you used in your interactive? Correct. And uh, which portion of the interactive are they photographs of? They're photographs of the garage or barn. Okay. And are they true and accurate representations of what you witnessed on June 9th and 10th, 2020? Yes. Uh, Your Honor, the state moves for admission of states exhibits 170 KKK through 170 WWW into, into evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor, we would object to them being cumulative evidence. All right, courts considered that objection as to this set of photographs, and I'll overrule the objection for the same rationale previously stated as how these photographs relate to the interactive exhibit that was admitted. So for that same rationale, the court overrules the cumulative objection and exhibits KKK through WWW sequentially have been admitted. Thank you. Just one moment, Your Honor.
Agent, can you, based on the testimony you've given and your experience and training, to you, what were the differences or the contrast between the grave site of Tylee Ryan and J.J. Vallow? I thought there was a big difference between J.J.'s burial, which was our first burial that we uncovered that we just talked about, where the stones were covered in such a precise way, and the planks were there, and J.J.'s human remains were all intact, wrapped in the plastic bags, and then the white bag at least was on a skull from what we saw, versus burial site two, where we at first couldn't even tell they were human remains. And then the way we found Tylee's remains, just kind of that mass of organic material at first, we didn't know what that was until we kind of pedestaled out that mass, went to uncover it, and it fell apart into pieces. Saw the burned, charred remains of Tylee's remains. So just such a big contrast for us as a team, going from J.J.'s, how precise everything was placed, the stones, the planks, the wrapping of the body, all intact, versus Tylee's melted, charred mass, how that was placed in that burial. Um, the, the items we found in the fire pit, you know, and at the time we didn't know, you know, as, a, as an evidence team, we didn't know the connections, if any. But just all those, those evidence items that we found. But, but just a huge, a huge difference. So yes. I think that's the best way to describe it from my Thank standpoint, you. being ERT that day. Uh, at this time, the state has no further questions, Your Honor. All right. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Mr. Thomas, will you be conducting cross? <laughs> yes, Your Honor. <clears throat> How are you doing today, Agent? Good, thank you, sir. Good. You indicated that uh, that you've been uh, and on the ERT team for somewhere between thirteen, about thirteen years. Is that right? I'm, I'm saying thirteen to fifteen years. I was I was off and on. Okay, and during that time, uh, you've been to five to seven. Covered burials, is that right? That's yeah, a good, a good approximate. Yeah, that's a good approximate. Sorry, uh, I didn't mean to talk over him. Yeah, let's make sure we don't get into that with the court reporter keeping the record, so please don't talk at the same time. So five to seven burials uh, over the past 13 to 15 years? I, I was on and off ERT, so I would say over the last 10, I would say over the last 12 years, um, approximately five to seven burials. Okay. And where where were those burials? Were they all in Idaho? I've always been in the Salt Lake City Division, which covers Utah, Idaho, and Montana. Okay. Um, and where where was your first uncovery of a burial? I'd have to look that up. You don't recall? I don't remember. Okay. Would you consider this two separate burials, or would you consider this particular case one burial? I would consider this two separate burials, mainly because of the contrast that I just described. Okay. So I guess what I'm asking is, when you say five to seven burials, are you saying five to seven different events or five to seven sites that you, or like, I don't know, how, do you, how would you describe it? I would say some of those were... Some of those, some of those burials were in the same burial, 
and some of them were individual in one burial. Okay. So how many sites, like how many times have you gone out and done a burial uncovery <laughs> over the course of your career? I'd say approximately five times. Okay. So I'd have to review I'd have to review a bunch of reports in okay. order to give you very specific details. All right. Have you ever done a burial in Idaho? Yes. Okay. Other than this one, I guess is what I'm asking. I believe so. I, I oh, I believe so. I'd need to check though just to be sure. Where would it be? Probably on the Fort Hall Indian Reservation. Okay. And what about, you, you indicated that your coverage area was Utah, Idaho, and Montana? Correct. Okay. Where, where in Montana would you have gone for a burial and covery? Um, we recently were in... Well, I probably shouldn't say the place. I probably shouldn't talk about specific cases. Well, it kind of goes to your credibility as to, you know, you, you seem to have a little bit of uh, knowledge recall issues. and what, so. How about I just say near Missoula, Montana. Okay. Um, I've, I've been on call outs near, let's say, Moscow, uh, Idaho. Um, okay. And, so, and a lot of those involve fire pits. So I've done multiple fire pit um, excavations, and that's excavating okay. human remains from fire pits. Okay. And there was a fire pit in this particular excavation. Correct. That's why it's. That's why I think those are important to mention. Okay. All right. And so, when when you do these, you, you mentioned how you kind of made it sort of a grid, right? Correct. All right. And on the grid of the fire pit, it wasn't like like exact squared off. We're going to do three foot by three foot grids, right? And we're going to we're going to sift everything in that three foot section, and then we're going to move to the next section, and everything that gets pulled from that section gets put in this pile, right? That's not how it worked. Uh, we created our own grids, so we didn't have three foot by three foot grids. We just created our own grids that we showed on the map. Right. And then we moved, we sifted things from different grids. Okay. So we, 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 co what we collected from one grid was collected out of that grid. So we did keep track of what came from one grid and then collected that as evidence. And, and where, where did those, like there were, there were in the fire pit area, there were four grid areas, right? There was four or five. I'd have to look at our at our chart. Four or five. Okay. So the the fire circle itself was that one grid. Yes. Okay. And anything outside of the fire circle, there was uh, a box or some sort of a not necessarily a square, but uh, some sort of a uh, an angular area, right? There that were grids outside of the fire pit, and the fire pit was one grid. Okay. And everything that you collected inside the fire pit went to a specific area. Correct. To a specific blue tarp. That that went to a that went to a blue tarp. That went to a sifting area and was sifted. Okay. And the other areas within that uh, fire pit area that had other grid areas. Were they sifted in a different spot or in the same spot? I'd have to check with our team members. I don't know if we sifted the other areas. Okay. So you definitely sifted the fire ring. Correct. But you're not sure if you sifted anything outside of the fire ring. Yeah, I don't know. I have to ask the other team members if we sifted anything from the other grids. All right. Well, we had about three years to prepare for this. You didn't. You, this didn't come up over the last three years? I didn't discuss this, no. Okay, all right. You mentioned that you were the, let me 
get it right here. Currently the team leader of the ERT. Is that right? Senior team leader for the evidence response team. Senior team leader. Uh, and are and is that like the the highest up you can go? Like everybody answers to you? I'm I'm over all of the evidence response team members in Utah, Idaho, and Montana. Oh, uh, okay, okay. So in your region, you're the senior uh, team leader for Correct. the ERT. Okay. Correct. But there are other regions, and they have senior team leaders as well? Correct. All right. And have you, on this particular case, met with any of those other senior team leaders in other areas of the country? No. Okay. I have, for pre in preparation for this search warrant, I did discuss this case with the evidence response team unit. And they oversee, they're based out of Quantico, uh, Fredericksburg, Virginia, and they oversee all of the evidence response teams nationwide. Okay, so the evidence response team, or the evidence response unit oversees the evidence response teams. Correct. Okay, that's, that's kind of where I was going with that. Okay. okay. Thank you, that's all I have. All right. Any redirect from the state? No, Your Honor. All right, that'll conclude the testimony then of uh, this agent. If I'll inquire of the state, is he going to be recalled potentially or can he be released from any subpoena? <coughs> Your Honor, uh, we believe we're done uh, with Mr. Daniels, but uh, just as out of a precaution, we would not ask to release him from a subpoena at this time. Okay, that'll conclude your testimony then, uh, and just the state will contact you if you think uh, they think there's a reason to recall you at some point, so you'll remain under subpoena at this time while the trial's still going. I'll have the bailiff help uh, escort you off the witness stand then, and the state can get prepared to call another witness. Thank you. The state would call Dr. Garth Warren. All right, now that the witness has been sworn, I'll just briefly inquire. Uh, Dr. Warren, have you viewed or listened in on or in any way reviewed any of the trial court testimony before you took the stand here today? No, Your Honor. All right, thank you for that. Uh, when you're being questioned, please make verbal responses so we keep a clear court record, and please also avoid talking at the same time as anyone questioning you so the record remains clear as well. With those ground rules in mind, then, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you may. Thank you. Can you please state your name for the record and spell it? And spell, spell your last name. Garth Warren, G-A-R-T-H-W-A-R-R-E-N. Right, Dr. Warren, what is your occupation or profession? I am a forensic pathologist. Okay. Uh, what is a forensic pathologist? So a uh, forensic pathologist is a, a medical doctor who essentially uh, tries to figure out why people die. And the main tool that we use is an autopsy. Uh, we use additional studies as well, uh, but the main tool is the autopsy. And ultimately, uh, we determine the cause and the manner of death. Okay. So you, you said you're a medical doctor. Are you a duly licensed physician in the state of Idaho? Yes. How long have you been licensed to practice your profession? 
So I've been practicing licensed in Idaho for approximately six years, almost six years, and I was licensed in my previous job in Colorado for five years, so a total of about 11 years. Okay. And you are, are you presently engaged uh, in the practice of being a forensic pathologist? Yes. Where did you receive your training in pathology? So I attended the University of Health Sciences um, Center in Portland, Oregon, um, Oregon Health Science Center, and I did a general pathology uh, residency and completed that. And after I completed my general residency, I stayed on for two more years uh, and did a two-year fellowship or just additional years of training in neuropathology, which is just the study of the pathology that <clears throat> excuse me, of the brain and the spinal cord. And then I went back to Denver uh, where I went to medical school and I did a one-year fellowship in forensic pathology. Uh, and I've been doing that ever since. Are you employed by the Ada County Coroner? Yes. And what are your duties as a medical examiner uh, in Ada County? So certain types of death deaths fall under our jurisdiction at the coroner's office. Uh, typically those are non-natural deaths. Um, they can be natural deaths, a sudden unexpected natural death in a young individual where the cause of death isn't apparent. Uh, we would take jurisdiction. But really anything else, accidents, suicides, homicides, any suspicious cases uh, would fall under our jurisdiction. Uh, so we have a whole team at the Ada County Coroner's Office. I play one role as the forensic pathologist. Uh, so um, I essentially will either perform an autopsy or some kind of examination to try to determine uh, why people die when they come <coughs> to our jurisdiction. Okay. To your knowledge, does the Ada County Coroner's Office have a contract with Fremont and Madison counties for you and other medical examiners to perform autopsy work? Yes. Okay. Uh, during your experience in the Ada County Coroner's Office, approximately how many autopsies have you performed? Oh, so it's usually between 200 and 250 autopsies a year. And so I've been practicing in Idaho for almost six years, so about 1,200 to 1,500 cases, and if you include Denver, it's between 2,000 and 200, uh, 2,500 cases. Okay. Are you on the staff or are you affiliated in any way with any universities or academic institutions? Yes, I am a adjunct professor at ICOM. Um, Idaho College of Medicine that's in Boise. Uh, we frequently have medical students who come and observe autopsies, uh, especially those who are interested in uh, going into pathology. So I asked you earlier what a, a forensic pathologist does, but exactly what does pathology involve? So pathology, by definition, is the study of disease. And it's, it's broken up into different branches. Um, the branch that you're probably, most people are most familiar with is the anatomical um, pathologist. So that's the pathologist where if you go to the doctor and you get a mole taken off your skin, or you have to have a liver biopsy, or you get anything removed, <clears throat> that that piece of tissue will essentially make its way to a laboratory, a clinical laboratory. And the pathologist will examine it, they'll look at it under the microscope, and they'll make a diagnosis. And then that diagnosis will be relayed to the clinician who will then give the information to the uh, patient. Uh, so a, lo a lot of pathologists spend their time looking under the microscope, making diagnoses. Uh, the other side of it is clinical pathology, and that's the clinical laboratory. So typically, um, a pathologist is in charge of the clinical laboratory. So anytime you've ever given a pee sample, a blood sample, um, that'll go to a clinical laboratory. It'll get tested. 
the pathologist oversees that. And the, then again, the results will get kicked back to your, the doctor who ordered it, your primary care doctor, and that will get relayed to you. So f where forensic pathology fits in that is it's essentially a subspecialty of anatomical pathology. Um, Are you a member of any specialized medical or scientific groups or associations? Yes, I am a member of the National Association of Medical Examiners. Uh, they're essentially the governing body of coroners and medical examiners across the country. Um, I also am, participate in uh, committees in the Treasure Valley uh, and maternal mortality um, fatality committee, uh, child fatality committee. Are you a member of the American Board of Pathology? Yes. What is the objective of this board? So this board is the governing board that gives you your actual board examination. So after, for instance, when I um, completed my general pathology, I had to take a day-long test, and I had to pass that test. And then the American Board of Pathology says, okay, you are fine to practice now. And the same thing with my neuropathology and forensic pathology. You have to take these long tests. Um, you have to pass them in order to practice pathology. So the, the objective of that board is essentially to make sure that uh, its members are qualified. Yes. Um, so, again, we briefly spoke about forensic pathology. Uh, will you explain in a little more detail what that term means? So forensic pathology, uh, that is the study of disease or trauma in the setting of the medical legal death investigation system and the legal system. Um, so typically cases that fall under the medical examiner or coroner's offices, as I, as I mentioned, are non-natural. Um, and our job essentially is to do some type of examination, typically an autopsy. Sometimes we just do an external examination. Uh, we do toxicology, um, and we'll do other studies. We'll do x-rays and so forth. And then based on that, I have to come up with a, a cause and a manner of death. And that's really my ultimate job, is to determine the cause and manner of death based on my findings. Can you explain the difference for the jury between manner of death and cause of death? So cause of death is what causes you to die. So that's a heart attack would be a cause of death. A gunshot wound to the head would be a cause of death. Um, a motor vehicle accident where somebody um, sustains multiple blunt force injuries, that would be a cause of death. A manner of death deals more with the circumstances surrounding the death. Um, and it's typically broken into five different options. It's natural, accident, suicide, homicide, and undetermined. So every time you do an autopsy, you do the cause, and you determine the manner. Uh, one example I always give for manner is where the circumstances, and this kind of goes into play, why the circumstances are, are so significant, is if you have somebody with a gunshot wound to the head, well, that could be self-inflicted, that could be a homicide, somebody else did it, could potentially be an accident, and sometimes the findings on the body would look exactly the same. So in order to determine the manner, you have to have a good idea of what the circumstances were when that individual was found, um, the law enforcement reports, uh, and so forth to accurately uh, determine the manner of death. Based on your expertise, can you tell the jury what an unattended death is? An unattended death uh, typically means that the death is unattended by a clinician. Um, so most state statutes, including Idaho, 
is if somebody dies, for instance, in a hospital, that's an attended death. There's doctors all over the place um, in the hospital. An unattended death would be somebody who dies outside the hospital in the absence of a doctor's presence. So at their home, that would be considered an unattended death. If somebody's found, say, in a park, um, that would be an unattended death. Is there a general procedure that you follow when performing an autopsy? Yes. What is that? So typically the first time I see the decedent or the body is in the morgue, is in the autopsy morgue. Um, typically the body is received in a body bag. Sometimes it's sealed um, to preserve evidence on cases that are suspicious or homicides. Sometimes it's not. Um, so the, the body is received in a body bag. Uh, we open the body bag, and the first thing I do is I observe just the decedent as is. So what, what were they wearing? Uh, did they have any personal effects? Is there any evidence of medical intervention? And once those are documented, I um, will take off the clothes, we'll take off the medical intervention, uh, we'll gather... Uh, evidence, if needed, uh, that's going to be case by case, and then we'll, we'll get the body naked, and then I'll do a head-to-toe exam, which is called the external examination, where I'll describe the hair, eye color, ears, uh, fingernails, pretty much everything from head to toe, and we're essentially looking for anything that could be a, a cause of death, any natural signs of death, any trauma. And then once I'm done documenting that, uh, I will do the internal examination. And that's what most people think about the autopsy. Uh, we will do uh, make incisions uh, that allow us to look at all the organs in the body, the heart, the lung, the liver, and so forth. Um, and with those organs, we'll weigh them, we'll examine them, we'll dissect them. Again, same idea. I'm looking for anything, any natural disease process, any traumatic uh, injuries that could explain the decedent's death. Also during the autopsy, we obtain specimens uh, for different reasons. Uh, we typically try to get blood, urine, and vitreous fluid, which is uh, fluid from the eyeball, and we will use those to perform a wide variety of different tests. We can do toxicology, we can look at electrolytes in the body, we can look for glucose, um, if somebody has diabetes. Uh, so we collect all those as well. During your years as a medical examiner, have you had occasion to observe many cases in which the manner of death was homicide or was linked to a homicide? Yes. Okay. Do you know approximately how many? I would say on average about 20 a year um, for... 10 to 11 years, so over 200. Okay. Doctor, were you involved in the autopsy of Joshua Jackson Vallow? Yes. Okay. If, if it's okay with you, I'm going to refer to him as JJ from here on out. Uh, when were you involved in that autopsy? On June 11, 2020. And where did that take place? That took place at the Ada County Morgue. Was this the first time you had ever seen J.J. Vallow? Yes. And approximately how long did that autopsy last? It took approximately four hours. Okay. And did you write a report summarizing your findings for that autopsy? I did. Based on that particular autopsy and based upon your education, training, and experience, have you formed an expert opinion concerning the cause of death of J.J. Vallow? I have. What was that? I determined the cause of death to be asphyxia by plastic bag over the head <laughs> and duct tape covering the mouth. And then there's another segment that's other significant conditions. Um, I put bound with duct tape, bruising of the arms, and abrasion to the neck. But ultimately, the, the cause of death was asphyxia uh, by plastic bag over the, he the head and duct tape over the mouth. 
And do you make a determination as to the manner of death? If the autopsy is performed in Ada County, I do. We mentioned that there's a contract between other counties. We perform autopsies for a wide variety of counties around the state of Idaho because there aren't enough forensic pathologists out there. In those cases, our contract essentially says that we'll do the cause and then the coroner will do the manner of death. Okay. When you commenced your autopsy of J.J. Vallow, can you describe for the jury what you initially observed? So initially, the body came within a sealed body bag. And it's sealed because we want to preserve evidence. It's just a way of us feeling confident that nobody's gotten into the bag or something's happened. So it's for evidence preservation. So we broke the seal on the bag and opened that bag up. And then the body was further enclosed within a black plastic tarp that was held together with multiple strips of duct tape. And then we opened that up and that was the first time that you could actually see the body. Right from the beginning, there were some things that obviously jumped out. One, there was a white plastic bag over J.J.'s head. And it was wrapped around the face multiple times with duct tape all the way down to the neck. In addition, the forearms and the hands were bound with duct tape and the ankles were bound with duct tape. J.J. was wearing red pajama tops, red pajama bottoms, and black socks. Another thing that was quite obvious is the body was in a state of decomposition. There was decomposition fluid and dirt and mold on the pajama tops and bottoms. You could tell even with the clothing on that the body was in a state of decomposition by the color of the skin. And at that point, we essentially took photographs, documented how the body was received, and then we proceeded. Okay. So you mentioned you took photographs and documented how the body was received. Did you then conduct an external examination? Yes. What steps did you take in your external examination? So for the external examination, I guess backing up a little bit, with everything that was on the body, the clothing, the duct tape, the bag over the head, at that point, we started gathering our evidence. So what we did is we took the pajama tops and bottoms off and we submitted that to law enforcement. We submitted the socks to law enforcement. The bag over the head with the duct tape, we made a single cut, removed it carefully, and we submitted that to law enforcement. With the duct tape around the arms, we made a single cut, unfolded that carefully, submitted that to law enforcement, and we also submitted the duct tape around the ankles. In addition to that evidence, we also did fingernail swabs for evidence. We did hand swabs. The fingernails actually easily came off because of the state of decomposition, so we ended up just submitting all of the nails for evidence. In addition to that, we didn't really know what was going on with the case as far as could there be a sexual component or not, so we did oral, anal, and penile swabs just to be careful. And then in addition to that, we took pulled head hair, a portion of the rib, and that was actually done during the autopsy, and two molars 
from JJ for DNA purposes. Bone, uh, the ribs, and the molars are a good source of DNA, and we, we kind of figured that DNA may be important in this case. Uh, so that was all the evidence that, that we got and submitted to law enforcement. And then as far as the external examination goes, like I said before, uh, I do an examination from, from head to toe. Uh, and as I stated before, one thing that was obvious was the body was in a state of decomposition. The head took on a green discoloration, neck. Um, other parts of the body had a light brown, leathery appearance. Um, that is consistent with decomposition. Uh, there, there's fairly extensive skin slippage uh, throughout the body, uh, including partial degloving or skin falling off of the hands and the feet. And that was um, essentially what I found. Uh, I also found some injuries um, that jumped out. Um, one injury was a scratch, uh, appeared to be, there were abrasions, it appeared to be scratch-like abrasions on the left side of the neck um, and hey, angle. Doctor, if I can ask you, why was that significant to you? Uh, that was significant to me um, in, in a case like this, uh, considering the way he was found. Um, if there's any kind of injuries to the neck, um, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a red flag. Uh, do I know exactly what it means? Uh, no, but I think some of the things that come to mind are, you know, did, you know, was JJ trying to get the bag off his head? And could they be scratch marks trying to get the bag off of his head? Um, you know, I, again, I wasn't there. I don't know exactly what happened, but those are the types of things that go through my, my head. Um, there are additional injuries, including bruising of both upper arms, symmetrical bruising on the right upper arm and left upper arm. And there's also a uh, diffuse hemorrhage on the underlying the right thumbnail. There, there were also other areas that were uh, concerning or suspicious for injuries uh, that looked like bruising. Uh, it, there were areas on the ankles that looked like bruising that may have been associated with the duct tape. So when I looked at it grossly, um, it, they looked like bruises. But in all the injuries I described on the, the arm, the leg, the ankles, uh, what you do in a case like this where there's significant decomposition is sometimes decomposition can, can make things look like a bruise when it's not a bruise. Uh, so we, we took incisions on the body in multiple areas that were concerning for bruising. Uh, the two areas that did show at least convincing hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissue underlying the skin were on both upper arms. Uh, the bruising on the legs or on the ankles didn't uh, show significant bruising or show bruising in the subcutaneous tissue. Um, so to me, that means that it, it could have been a bruise, but I, I can't confidently say that it was. And so, Doctor, you uh, when you mentioned the hemorrhaging below the subcutaneous, did I say that correctly? Yes. Uh, layer, <clears throat> uh, was, to you, was that confirmation of bruising on the arms? Yes. And was there anything else uh, notable in your external examination? I believe those were the most significant findings that I can rem remember off the top of my head. Did you find any signs of disease in your external examination? No. Okay. And after your external examination, you conducted an internal examination? That's correct. Uh, can you describe that process for the jury? Uh, yes. Yeah. So as I stated before, we make incisions um, on the torso and on the scalp uh, that allow us to evaluate the brain, heart, lungs, look at the ribs, all the different organs in the abdominal cavity. In this particular case, all the organs were still there. 
and they were still well defined, um, meaning I could tell that's a heart, that's the right lung, there's the liver, there's the adrenal gland, so forth. Um, all of the organs, as to be expected, showed um, decomposition changes, um, but I, I did not see any trauma to the internal organs, and I did not see any evidence of overt natural disease to any of the organs. Did you check for rib fractures? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I did. Um, I actually, uh, when you remove the chest plate, you get a good look at the ribs. And in this case, on a case where you're really looking hard, what you do is there, there's a, a thin layer of soft tissue, uh, the pleura, <clears throat> that you actually, in this case, I pulled away to even evaluate so I could actually see the bone itself. And I did not observe any rib fractures. Why would you look for rib fractures? Rib fractures, depending on the case, and that can have different meaning. Um, it's important for me just to document everything that I see and everything that I find. Uh, so one reason is simply documenting it. I may not exactly know what it would mean at the time, uh, but it is a finding. Uh, you can get rib fractures from trauma. Uh, for instance, you're skiing and you fall down, you get rib fractures. Um, you can get rib fractures from CPR. Uh, we know in this case no CPR was performed, uh, so we didn't have to wor worry about that. Uh, but ultimately it's just another uh, piece of the puzzle, another finding to explain any kind of trauma. Uh, you stated you examined the organs. Did that include the lungs? Yes. Was, did you see anything remarkable in the lungs? No, I didn't, other than decomposition changes. Okay. Upon completion of your uh, internal exam, uh, what did you do? So... I guess going back a little bit, during the exam, like I stated, uh, during the autopsy is when you typically get um, samples, either to look at microscopically or to send to laboratories. So after the autopsy is completed and we had gathered that, uh, we were able to gather um, uh, basically tissue from each organ to look at under the microscope, and I did that at a later day. Uh, in this case, because of the state of decomposition, there was no blood, uh, there was no urine, and there was no vitreous fluid. So we ended up sending a sample of liver for toxicology, which is considered a good sample to send in a decomposed case when you don't have options for the other. Um, so after, after the case was done, um, I essentially had to just wait for those findings, to look at the histology, uh, to look and see what toxicology showed. Um, we also did full body x-rays in this case before the autopsy, looking for any kinds of uh, bony abnormalities. Okay. Uh, what were the results of the x-rays? The x-rays uh, did not show any overt uh, bony fractures or bony abnormalities. Okay. Uh, and you mentioned that you sent off portions of the liver for a toxicology report. That's correct. And did you receive the results of that? Yes. Uh, was there, uh, what did you find in the toxicology report? So uh, in the toxicology report, there were uh, low levels of ethanol, so alcohol. Uh, there was... Um, a substance or a drug called uh, GHB, gamma hydroxybutyric acid. Um, there was also a substance called eobromine, and, and I believe there's also caffeine. Okay. Um, do you know what theobromine is? Theobromine is, it can be found in cocoa and uh, tea products. And GHB, uh, what is that? 
So GHB, uh, gamma hydroxybutyric acid, it, it's a, a drug, or one, it can be a drug, and it can be used for medicinal purposes or recreationally. Uh, for medicinal purposes, sometimes it can be used for narcolepsy. I think at one point in time, it was used as a possible anesthetic um, f or for anesthesiology. Uh, recreationally, um, it's often referred to as liquid ecstasy. Um, some refer it to as a date rate drug. Um, so it, what it does, it acts as a uh, depressant on the central nervous system. It, it can give you a sense of euphoria. Uh, it can give you a sense of calming, relaxation. It can increase libido. Uh, it can cause amnesia as well, uh, which essentially would be loss of memory during the time that you have the substance is on board. Um, so recreationally, it can be used for all of those things. Um, and in addition, GHB is naturally found in the human body. It is predominantly in the central nervous system. And again, like I stated, it acts as a depressant. And it also can be found in lower amounts in the peripheral tissues. Okay. And were the amounts of GHB... Uh, how would you characterize the amount of GHB found in J.J. Vallow? The best way to uh, describe it is inconclusive. Uh, so GHB was found. So we know through literature, the medical literature, that GHB can be found in tissues, including liver, uh, post-mortem. Um, so it, th there's really n no way for me to tell for sure whether this is just a naturally occurring product in the body that was there or if JJ was given GHB. It's, I, I can't say one way or the other based on the levels. Okay. Your Honor, we're about to uh, enter a different portion of this uh, questioning and I wonder if this might be a good time for the mid-morning break. Okay, agreed that it is, so we will go ahead and take our mid-morning break and try to uh, come back on in about 20 minutes or so. I know they are having some technical issues with the simulcast, so perhaps they can work on that. We'll see where things stand for that, but we'll take that mid-morning break and come back on soon. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, if we're ready, we can have the jurors brought in.
All right. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on KCR 22-211624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Ballow. Mr. Wood, you can continue with your direct examination of this witness. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Warren, before we took uh, the mid-morning break, you had, uh, we had walked through the external and internal autopsy examination of J.J. Ballow, correct? And uh, you mentioned that photos were taken during that ex during that examination, correct? Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be handed what's been marked as State's Exhibit 176A through 176MM. Uh, copies have previously been provided to the court and counsel. And Your Honor, I'm not sure if his microphone is on. The, the... I I just turned it on. Thank you. Doctor, can you look through State's Exhibit 176A through 176MM, uh, briefly review that, and then let me know when you've had a chance to review it. Okay. Okay. Do you recognize States Exhibits A through 
or I'm sorry, States Exhibit 176A through MM? Yes. What do they purport to be? These are photographs that were taken uh, during the autopsy. And this is the autopsy you discussed earlier on June 11th of 2020? That's correct. And you were, you were present for that autopsy? Yes. Uh, and do you recognize these uh, photographs as true and accurate representations of what you witnessed and observed on that day? Yes. Uh, were some of these taken at your direction? Yes. Okay. Uh, Your Honor, the state moves for admission of states, exhibit 170, states Exhibits 176A through 176MM into evidence. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. Under uh, Item Rules of Evidence 403, We'd ask the court to exclude these based on uh, the fact that we believe they are more prejudicial than probative. All right, what's the response from the state on that objection? Your Honor, these are uh, photographs of, of what actually happened, what actually transpired in the autopsy. Uh, there is no better evidence to explain um, the autopsy process uh, then by these along with Dr. Warren's testimony. Uh, they are true, they are accurate, and as such, uh, I do not believe that 403 applies in this case. All right, I've considered that objection. Uh, the court does not find that they are unnecessarily prejudicial or unduly prejudicial given the foundations that have been laid as to this particular witness his expertise and his, uh, the autopsy performed here as it relates to the state's theory of the case. So having considered that objection, the objection will be overruled and for that reason exhibits photographs 176A um, and so the record's clear that goes through 176Z and then starting at 176AA through 176MM are admitted. Your Honor, I apologize. May the court reconsider possibly doing this in a black and white format rather than full color? And the state would object to that. Uh, there's no reason to alter the reality of the photographs. Well, as I said, it was on, well. All right, and I've considered that objection as well. Um, let me have a quick sidebar with counsel, however. Thank you. Please be seated. All right, Council, we had a sidebar, and as it related to these autopsy photographs, um, I have considered this evidence and I apologize for the delay this caused. I made a decision that caused us to make some technical adjustments here. Um, based on objections lost by the defense and in consideration of whether or not uh, a particular exhibit may become um, potentially <coughs> prejudicial or inflammatory, uh, the courts determined that, number one, it would be inappropriate for many of these photographs to be publicly demonstrated because of the graphic nature of the photographs. Uh, number two, the jurors are entitled to view and see the photographs, but the size of the screen, um, if they're projected up onto the monitor up there, I would find uh, potentially could be prejudicial just to blow the photos up to that size. And so they will be demonstrated and may be published to the jurors, but through the monitors that the jurors have, to contain the size of them and perhaps limit the impact they may have um, with regards to the objection made by the defense. So as I understand it, I believe we've arranged things so that these photographs will be shown on the monitor of the witness, which the court can see, 
counsel should be able to see as well and the jurors but not the public and they won't be shown on the overhead projector so uh, thanks for your patience and us getting that set up mr. wood they shouldn't be able to so we'll have to double check as we get going here before we get into the more graphic photographs and make sure they're not being shown in the simulcast location also Council, just with the state's monitor, perhaps if you could also um, just position yourselves in such a way that it's not just totally visible to all the public here. So uh, that's the ruling I've got in terms of publishing these. So, Mr. Wood, I apologize for the interruption. Uh, with that ruling, we'll get started, and then uh, hopefully things are technolo technologically set up to incorporate that ruling. Thank you, Your Honor. I would just note for the record the state uh, did not take a position on that and just left it at the discretion of the court. Okay, thanks Mr. Wood, that's correct. May I, may I have permission to publish now? Yes. Okay. Dr. Warren, do you see that on your screen? Yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I would know I'm a little bit blind as to how this looks to the jury um, and on the screen. So uh, I may need some okay. feedback on it. I think your counsel can probably help okay. you as well with their monitor. What is, uh, what is depicted in State's Exhibit 176A? This is a photograph. Uh, that the decedent was in um, when I first saw the decedent, how the body was received in a black sealed body bag. Uh, you can see there's a red seal uh, that's sealing the zipper of the body bag. And the ruler is simply, um, that's the case number that we have assigned to this particular case. Can you read that, sorry, can you read that case number into the record? It's 200611-15. Thank you. Uh, what is the significance of the uh, that lock or seal? It's essentially to preserve evidence. As I stated before, uh, it ensures, it let, lets us know that uh, nobody has gotten into the body bag um, if it's sealed and uh, hampered with evidence in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, can, can we have just a second? I apologize. Um, I'm, there's really no objection other than the fact that there's no way to follow the court's order because the state's screen is being viewed by everybody back here, and I'm not sure about the jurors uh, if their if their monitors are being seen. All right, I don't believe the juror monitors are visible to the public, and the one concern monitor I guess is at the state's council table and if there's just a way um, maybe Mr. Rammel you could just stand behind that as a way to block view of the public behind you. I knew having this many prosecutors would come in handy at some point. Yes. You could do that as well. I mean, that, if if the monitor would turn around, maybe just for this portion, you could do that.
Okay. okay. Thank you, Mr. Rammel. Your Honor, can we request another sidebar? Yes. All right, apologies again for that delay working on the logistics here for a moment. I think we've got things worked out now, and I think we have uh, cut one of the camera feeds for the simulcast, but we still have the audio and the other camera feeds. So, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to uh, continue with your direct examination at this time, you can. Thank you. Oh. Okay, we're okay. May I continue? You may. Thank Thanks, you. Mr. Wood. Doctor, uh, what do you, uh, what is in States Exhibit 176B? This is the red body lock after it's been cut uh, by our forensic team and removed. Can you describe what you see in States Exhibit 176C? So after the sealed black body bag was opened uh, and you can see here that the body is further uh, enclosed within a black uh, plastic tarp that's held together with multiple strips of duct tape. And uh, when you reached that point in your uh, autopsy, what did you do? At that point, uh, we opened that bag and we had to peel back some of the duct tape in order to do so. And then we handed over that black bag uh, to law enforcement as evidence. Can you describe what you see in States Exhibit 176D? So you can see here, the deceased is within that black body bag. So I guess at this point, we actually haven't submitted as evidence yet. Uh, but this is when we opened up that, that black bag with uh, the duct tape. And this is the first view of uh, JJ, uh, the deceased. You can see, you can't see it real well on this photograph, but there is a white plastic bag uh, over the head and it's wrapped multiple times with duct tape. Can you describe what you see in States 176E? So this is a better photograph that shows the white plastic bag over the head and the duct tape over the head. You can see there is a defect right above the duct tape on the white plastic bag. And I was informed before the autopsy started that law enforcement had made a small tear in that bag just to make sure that there was human hair and it was identifiable. Um, and so that's why that is presumably there. Uh, and is the area where I'm pointing my pen the defect you're referring to? Yes. Okay. In addition, you can see JJ is clothed in a red pajama top uh, that's partially soaked with decomposition fluid. And you can also see that the forearms and the wrists and the hands are tightly bound with, with duct tape as well. Can you describe what you witnessed in States Exhibit 176F? 
This is a photograph of the lower body now. You can see there's a blue and white blanket that partially covers the lower extremities. Uh, you can also see that JJ is wearing a red pajama bottom um, and black ankle high socks. And then you can also see the duct tape. Uh, the ankles are bound with duct tape as well. Doctor, can you describe what you witnessed in States 176G? This is essentially another photo. It's just a different point of view. Okay. And in, what did you observe in 176H? So this is a photograph with the blanket removed. You can better see uh, what JJ is uh, wearing. And you can also see the extent of the uh, decomposition fluid uh, on the clothing better, uh, as well as you can see a portion, a small portion of his arm, his left upper arm. And you can see it's in a state of decomposition. It's got a kind of a tan, leathery appearance with skin slippage, which is consistent with decomposition. Can you describe what you witnessed in States Exhibit 176I? And this is simply a photograph of the lower half of the body uh, with the blanket removed, just better showing uh, the pajama pants okay. that JJ was wearing. And in 176J. Again, the lower half with the blanket removed, you can see the ankles are bound uh, with duct tape. Doctor, can you describe what you witnessed in 176K? So as I mentioned, uh, at this point, we're gathering evidence. Uh, so at this point, we made a single cut along the left side of the head to remove the white plastic bag and the surrounding duct tape. Uh, and we reflected it, and you can see uh, JJ, a portion of JJ's face at least. Um, and you can see that there's a strip of duct tape covering JJ's mouth that's essentially running from jawline to jawline. Can you describe what's in States Exhibit 176L? So we carefully removed the plastic bag and the duct tape uh, from JJ's head. And we that's, that's a view on the inside. Um, so that would have been where JJ's face was. And you can see there is, there is some fluid and there is some um, tissue, decomposed tissue. And that fluid is, uh, I interpret it as being decomposition fluid. It's, it's common to get decomposition fluid or purge fluid um, after somebody dies, especially when they're going through the decomposition process. So um, my interpretation was this was some sloughed off skin from JJ's face and decomposition fluid or purge fluid. Can you describe what you witnessed in States Exhibit 176M? So this is the, a photograph with the bag uh, with duct tape removed, better showing uh, the strip of duct tape covering JJ's mouth. Uh, you can also see that JJ's face uh, is in a state of decomposition um, 
it's diffusely, has a diffuse green discoloration, and there is skin slippage, uh, predominantly near the forehead, and you can also see his hair. Doctor, just for clarification, uh, where I'm pointing my pen, is that where you're describing skin slippage? Yes. Can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 176N? So this is the strip of duct tape covering uh, the decedent's mouth, and we submitted this to law enforcement as evidence. Doctor, we describe what you observed in states 176 O. So this photograph uh, just highlights the um, duct tape or the forearms and the wrist and the hands that are uh, wrapped multiple times with duct tape. And can you describe what you observed in States 176Q? Yes, so I was with the, the bag and the duct tape over the head. Um, the decision was made to make a, a single cut uh, across and reflect the duct tape binding the forms and wrists and hands. So that is a photo after the single cut is made and it's reflected. And you can see JJ's hands. Uh, you can see that his wrists are further bound uh, with duct tape, additional duct tape. And you can see on the inside of the large piece of duct tape, uh, there's decomposition uh, changes and fluid similar to the back over the head. Okay, and just for clarification, doctor, is where I'm pointing my pen where you referred to the additional duct tape? Correct. Okay. Can you describe what you observed in States 176R? Yes, so this is the... A uh, large band of duct tape uh, that is re now removed from JJ's arms, and this is how we submitted it to law enforcement. This is still looking on the outside, so this is um, looking at it as you saw it on JJ. Okay. And can you describe what you observed in states 176 S? Uh, this is the same duct tape, and it's just flipped over, and now you can see uh, the inside of the duct tape. I guess the only thing that's really notable is that you can see the decomposition staining on uh, large portions of the duct tape. Detective. Detective. Doctor, sorry. Uh, can you describe uh, what you observed in States Exhibit 176P? This is simply a close-up picture um, of the duct tape around the wrists. Okay. Um, and when you reviewed that, how, how specifically was that wrapped around the wrist? Right, so how was it wrapped around a wrist? So it appeared that it had been wrapped around one wrist, and then the other wrist had been laid on top of it, and then that was wrapped around the other wrist separately. So they weren't wrapped together per se, but more like one was wrapped, and then the other one was wrapped.
can you describe what you observed in states? Exhibit 176T. This is a photograph of the duct tape after it's been removed around the wrists and how it was submitted to law enforcement. And is that the same thing as in States Exhibit 176U? Yes. Just the opposite side? That's correct. Thank you. Can you describe uh, what you saw in States Exhibit 176V? So in addition to the red pajamas and the socks, uh, JJ was wearing a diaper. Uh, this diaper, as you can see, uh, near the top of the photograph, um, it's still, um, you can see the white and the blue, the normal coloring of the diaper. Uh, in the mid portion, especially towards the bottom of the diaper, um, that, that's all decomposition fluid and probably decomposition sloughed off tissue. Okay. What was the significance of your examination uh, that's represented in States Exhibit 176X? This is a photograph of JJ's face. The importance of that is one, we always get a photograph of the decedent's face um, just as part of the normal process. Two, at the time, it did help us with a preliminary identification, visual identification, um, based on photos that I had seen and everyone else in the room had seen uh, that this did look like JJ. Uh, so uh, it served that purpose as well. And what did you witness in States Exhibit 176Y? This is a photograph of JJ's upper body, including his face and his arms. Uh, this is to show the state of decomposition that he was in. Um, as already noted, his face has a diffusely green discoloration. Uh, on his chest, abdomen, and upper arms, uh, you can see that there's a uh, green to tan skin discoloration, and there's uh, fairly extensive skin slippage that's scattered on the chest, the abdomen, uh, both upper arms, and you can see a little bit on the hands. Can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 176AA? This is a photograph of JJ's lower half, uh, his legs and his feet. And that's a very similar appearance to that of his chest and abdomen in that there's a obvious discoloration, uh, tan greenish discoloration, and there are scattered skin slippage on both thighs, knees, uh, shins, and both feet. What did you observe in States Exhibit 176 BB? This is a photograph of JJ face down. Uh, this is uh, standard procedure in our autopsy photographs. We always get photographs of the scene laying face down so we can better evaluate the back, uh, the anus, and the lower legs on the back side. Um, this simply shows that there's uh, decomposition involving the back and the shoulders. Uh, you can see there's 
pretty prominent dark green discoloration of the upper back, shoulders, and upper arms, and to a lesser extent, uh, a lighter green on the rest of the back. Okay. Uh, doctor, do you have an opinion as to what these spots on the side of JJ are? Yes, yeah, so there were multiple white uh, punctate spots that were on the torso on both sides, and those are uh, essentially minerals or um, salt deposition, calcium, and other minerals, um, and that can be part of the decomposition process. And can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 176 C C? This is a photograph of JJ's lower half, face down, uh, from his buttocks down to his feet. Again, uh, showing the evidence of decomposition and the discoloration of the skin. Um, and there was also partial degloving or significant uh, slippage of both feet. Can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 176 D D? Yes. So So this is a photograph of JJ's arm, um, and it's highlighted with the ruler. Uh, you can see there's some discoloration. Um, as I mentioned before, with decomposition, you can get different types of colors. Um, some of them can mimic bruising. Um, this one kind of jump out as it looked more than a decomposition change. It looked more like bruising. It was dark red. Um, so that's a photograph of that. So you believed it at the time it was possibly bruising? Correct. Okay. And what did you observe in State's Exhibit 176 E E? So this is just a closer up photograph of what appeared to be bruising on JJ's arm. And can you tell the jury what you observed in, and did in 176 FF? So this is a photograph of that same area of what I thought to be bruising. And oftentimes what I will do and what other forensic pathologists will do in cases where uh, the body is decomposed is we'll make an incision into that bruise and we'll look for hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissue and the soft tissue. Um, the idea being that if you do see actual hemorrhage in the subcutaneous and soft tissue that it is true and true versus the artifact of decomposition. Um, so you can see uh, this is an incision. Uh, the forceps are holding it back, reflecting it. And you can see pretty obvious hemorrhage uh, with, within the subcutaneous tissue and that yellow adipose tissue as well. Doctor, you may have already stated this, but what portion of his arm was this? So there were bruising on bilateral upper arms, and they were symmetric. So this was on the right arm. Okay. And when you talked about the hemorrhaging, just to clarify, where I'm, where I'm pointing my pen now, uh, is that the hemorrhaging you were speaking of? Yes. Okay.
Can you state what you observed in States Exhibit 176 MM? So this is a photograph of JJ's neck, the left side of his neck. And you can see, if I can orient you a little better, so at the top you can see hair. So that would be hair on the left side, um, of, on the left side of JJ's head. And then this is a, a photograph of the left side of his neck. So there's a couple things you can see. One, you can see a slight or faint impression of where the duct tape was around the neck. Um, and it's fairly well delineated. And then in addition, you can see multiple brown to light brown um, abrasions. Uh, some with a small amount of red hemorrhage uh, that are scattered on the left side of the neck and on the left angle of the jaw. Doctor, I'm going to ask you to pause real quick. I just realized I put this on the Elmo at my angle. Uh, would it, is it better seen at that angle? Yes. Okay, I apologize. So to orient you now, so JJ's eyes and his nose and his head would be it's out of view, but it would be on the top part of this photograph. Uh, his body would be on the bottom half of this photograph. And this is a photograph of his, the left side of his neck. So again, the, uh, the impression, if you can appreciate that, it's very well delineated um, along the superior inferior borders. And then you have multiple uh, abrasions, these light brown to red uh, abrasions that appear most consistent with scratch-like abrasions uh, in my experience, uh, some with hemorrhage that are on the uh, left side of the neck and the left angle of the jaw. Doctor, just uh, for clarification, um, where we aren't able to use a pointer here, um, when you mentioned the impression, is this what you're referring to? Yes. Okay. And are these the abrasions you're referring to? Yes, that's correct. Okay. Doctor, can you point out what you observed in States Exhibit 176 II? Yes, yeah, so this is a photograph of JJ's right hand. As mentioned earlier, there was partial degloving, which essentially means there's a significant amount of skin slippage on the hands. Um, and you can see the right thumb. Um, and this sticks out. Uh, all the other fingernails had a very similar appearance, uh, pretty unremarkable. The right fingernail or subungual tissue underneath the fingernail, uh, there's this bright red bruising. Doctor, is this what you're referring to where I'm pointing my pen? Yes. And what, what is the significance of that? It essentially means that there's been trauma uh, to that area and blood vessels have been broken and it essentially has caused a bruise. Um, Can you describe uh, what you observed in States Exhibit 176, JJ? 
This is a photograph of uh, JJ's lower leg, including a shin, left ankle, and portion of the foot. I believe I mentioned earlier that when we removed the duct tape from the ankles, it did appear that there may be some bruising that was associated with that. Uh, to the naked eye, just looking at it, it looked like bruising to me. Um, I did the same thing as I did with the arm, and I made multiple sections looking for a hemorrhage in the subcutaneous tissue, and I did not see any obvious hemorrhage in that area. So what does that mean? Um, it's Objection, there is no question. I'll sustain, it's an error. <clears throat> uh, when, you, when you did that incision and observed the lack of hemorrhaging, what did that mean to you? So it was inconclusive to me. I can't completely rule out that it's not a bruise, but I can't say that it really is. It, it could be part of the decomposition process. Uh, doctor, I had you read the um, the number on the ruler into the record earlier. Uh, how was that number assigned? That number is assigned as soon as the case comes in. Uh, we have a computer system, and it's called MDI Log. And in order to enter all the data into our data system, you have to have a number. Um, so this is the number that got assigned to this particular case. And does that does that aid your uh, your lab and office in tracking the specific evidence? Yes, it does. Your Honor, I'm about to move into a separate discussion with Dr. Warren. Um, more than happy to take up another 10 minutes to do so, uh, but just wanted to ask if the court wanted to break for lunch now or to continue going. Are you through those exhibits at this time, Mr. Wood? Yes. Okay. Um, I would suggest let's keep going for a few more minutes. If you want to go into a new topic, uh, we'll take a moment and reconvert things to the way they were in terms of the monitors in the case. I will note on the record also that um, the victims, if they would like, will be given an opportunity to view these exhibits uh, in a separate setting. Um, I'll leave that up to them to communicate with the state's victim witness coordinator if they wish to see those. Very good. Doctor, were you involved in the autopsy of a Tylee Ryan? Just a moment, Mr. Wood. I'm going to let your counsel go ahead and flip oh. the table back around with their monitor so they're set up the way they're more comfortable. And I appreciate everybody's uh, assistance on setting that up the way we did. <coughs> All right, Mr. Wood, you can continue. Thank you. And uh, actually, I'm going to circle back to a couple things before I, I move on. Um, doctor, in regards to the bruising you found on JJ's arms, are you able to make any type of determination if that is pre or post mortem? Based on my findings, I believe that bruising in the arms is 
anti-mortem. When you say anti-mortem, is that before? Yes, before death. Okay. And uh, what leads you to believe that? Well, essentially, um, because, well, one, they looked like bruises when you just looked at them. And then two, when I made the incisions and there was hemorrhage um, in the soft tissues and subcutaneous tissue, um, it, it definitely uh, suggests that it was anti-mortem. Uh, when somebody dies, um, there's no longer circulation. Um, so if, for instance, somebody's picked up after they're dead by the arms, you wouldn't expect uh, bruising, especially in this subcutaneous tissue like you saw in that case, in this case. And then in the area of the neck where you described uh, the abrasions, I believe, uh, could those abrasions just be decomposition? I don't believe so. Uh, the reason being is they look like abrasions. Um, they oftentimes abrasions that are post-mortem take on a certain look to them. Uh, they will have a yellow appearance. Um, they'll have a very waxy appearance to them, They're very firm. And there's rarely or if ever any hemorrhage associated with them. Uh, the abrasions on the neck in this particular case on JJ's neck, uh, they had more of a, a tan brown to red appearance and there was hemorrhage associated with them. So that makes me believe that those are also anti-mortem as well. Okay, thank you. Doctor, were you involved in an autopsy of Tylee Ryan? Yes. When did that take place? It started on the same day as JJ's case. After we finished JJ's case on June 11, 2020, uh, we took a very short break and then we started Tylee's case. Okay. And was that then also at the Ada County Coroner's Office? Yes. Okay. Um, how did that autopsy commence? What did you first observe? Uh, so this autopsy was different. Um, the vast majority of the times when I perform an autopsy, uh, I get an entire body, and there's a very, there's a process that we went through, like with JJ, that I go through. Um, Tylee's case was different. Um, it was received by me um, in, or Tylee's remains were received in three separate sealed bags. Um, one of the bags, or two of the bags, were black body bags, and the third was a large brown paper bag uh, that was sealed, and within that contained five other um, paper bags within it. Um, so I received, essentially I received Tylee's um, remains in multiple different bags. Okay. How long did that autopsy last? That autopsy lasted um, it was much longer uh, because of the process of uh, sifting through the remains, trying to identify bones, soft tissue, uh, multiple x-rays, cleaning the bones, getting them ready for anthropology. Um, it, it took on the order of several days probably about a week. Okay. And I'm sorry, did you just say you x-rayed that material? Yes, we x-rayed all the bags and all the material that we received. And what was the purpose of those x-rays? You do that um, in order, you're, you're looking for uh, one, what kind of possible remains you have, how many bones can you see in the x-rays, um, so what are we kind of looking at as far as how much do we receive? Uh, you're also looking for foreign objects. Uh, <coughs> most importantly, you're looking for projectiles such as a bullet. Uh, in this case, you know, we had to keep an open mind. We were looking for anything, you know, bullets, 
Um, is there any portion of a knife? Is there any other foreign debris uh, that can be found on x-rays that we could collect as evidence? Okay, and did you find anything with those x-rays? There were no projectiles. Uh, there were no uh, portions or pieces of weapons. Um, essentially what we saw was um, collections of bones um, in most of them along with other debris. Y you could see um, there's a lot of mud, a lot of um, dirt um, that came up on the x-rays as well. Okay. Uh, based on the remains you received, were you able to do any types of toxicology? Yes. Uh, how, how were you able to do that? So in this case, um, with the remains, uh, there was no blood to send, there was no urine, no vitreous fluid. Um, so one sample that can be used for toxicology is skeletal muscle. And uh, in this particular case, there were um, large pieces of identifiable skeletal muscle. Uh, so I cut into the skeletal muscle and I got the, the best tissue that I could and then we send that for toxicology. And did you receive reports of that toxicology? Yes. Uh, what were the results of that? So I believe uh, it came back positive for ibuprofen it came back for a common decompositional product that we see in most cases of decomposition. Uh, it came back with uh, a carbon monoxide level, uh, a carboxyhemoglobin saturation level, and also oh, sorry, a carboxyhemoglobin saturation level, and also iron. So just to explain the iron, carboxyhemoglobin, those. Um, so any kind, of, any kind of fire death, in this case we knew we were dealing with uh, burnt remains. Um, we, we tested for carboxyhemoglobin. So carboxyhemoglobin um, or carbon monoxide in fire is often released um, along with multiple other gases. And if that is breathed in and the person is alive, then you'll get a high carboxyhemoglobin saturation level. So that's why we even did that test. In, the, in this particular uh, case, the carboxyhema, uh, or the c carbon monoxide level came back extremely low, um, meaning that there was, th there's no evidence to support that Ty Lee was alive when she was burned. Uh, skeletal muscle is not the best sample to test for that. Blood is, but skeletal could give you a, a, an idea. Okay. Were you able to find and identify any um, organs? Yes. Uh, what did you find? So, amongst the debris of um, the dismembered body, we were able to find, uh, I was able to find the heart. I was able to find, and it was actually connected still to the right and the left lung. Um, I was able to find one kidney. Um, I was able to find a few small segments of bowel. I was able to find portions of a liver and also there were very small fragments of brain matter. Now with, with that being said, um, this, this was not like in JJ's where the organs were very still intact and easily identifiable. Uh, these organs had severe decomposition, um, they had significant burning artifact. They were charred, they were shrunken, um, but those were the organs that I, I found. And presumably the rest of the organs either burned away um, or just were never found. Okay. 
And were you able to identify specific bones? Yes. Uh, can you just give a, a brief summary of some of the bones you were able to identify? Yes. Uh, so in one of the large bags, there was essentially the pelvis with portions of the, at least first portion of the femur that were attached to them. So your right pelvis, left pelvis, sacrum, and then portions, small portions of the femur. In one of the other large bags, uh, we were able to find um, portions of the skull, including the uh, superior portion of the orbit, uh, where the eyeball would be, um, other fragments of the skull, uh, fragments of the mandible and maxilla, uh, with some teeth still intact. Uh, there were more, multiple vertebral uh, bodies from your vertebral column uh, that were identified, uh, both clavicles. Uh, there were multiple long bones, including um, the tibia and fibula from your lower leg, uh, the radius and ulna from your forearm, a uh, portion of the sternum uh, was identified, multiple rib fragments uh, were identified. Um, I think those were the the main bones that were found. And again, these weren't nice, clean bones. These were bones uh, that had significant artifact secondary to uh, the fire. Okay. So when you say this, significant artifact, does that mean effects of the fire? Yes, they're they were blackened and charred, uh, and also. Um, it was presumed that some of, it, some of it, the artifact was due to the dismembering process as well. Okay. Uh, Mr. Wood, would this be a good time to be able to break? Can I ask a couple more questions? Sure, go ahead. Thanks. Dr. Warren, based on your autopsy of Tyree Ryan and based upon your education, training, and experience, have you formed an expert opinion concerning the cause of death of Tyree Ryan? Yes. I. Uh, what is that cause of death? I determined the cause of death to be homicide by unspecified means. Uh, and homicide by unspecified means, does that have a uh, specific definition? It does. So homicide by unspecified means uh, is a term that is or can be used for the cause of death uh, when the forensic pathologist has essentially looked at the totality of the case including the circumstances of the death, uh, the autopsy findings and lack thereof autopsy findings in this case, uh, the toxicology, and also uh, based on medical and social records um, that the forensic pathologist, which is me in this case, um, feels that the, the cause of death was by homicide, but I just can't pinpoint exactly what that was. Most homicides, you can say something like a gunshot wound to the head when the body's intact or a stab wound to the heart. Um, I can't do that in this case. Um, and it should be noted that I guess the, the term um, homicide by unspecified means, it, it's widely used in the forensic pathology world. Um, and it's been around for decades, for several years, and there's been published articles about specific guidelines and criteria that you should follow in order to come to that conclusion. Um, so that's where that term comes from. Okay. I, Your Honor, I, we can break now, and then we'll continue with okay. Dr. Warren after the lunch break. We will take the break. Uh, this time today, we'll take a full hour for lunch. Give uh, the jurors a chance to get caught up and have a little extra time today, so we'll come back on the record after lunch. All right, please.
Thank you. Please be seated. All right, let's have the jurors brought in, please. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay, we're back on the record on case CR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow. We just concluded the lunch recess. Uh, Mr. Wood is continuing with direct examination of Dr. Warren before we start with uh, continued examination, Mr. Wood, just as a housekeeping issue. In terms of the last set of photographs, they were uh, moved for and admitted in a chronological fashion. I advise that, in fact, uh, certain letters in there were not actually introduced, so that would be 176 W, Z, and KK. Is that Yes, that is accurate. Okay. So, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there will be an instruction given to you later that uh, at times things, there may be gaps in numbering or lettering. So this would be one such instance where likely uh, if your notes said something was admitted, um, those three were not in the sequence of those photographs. So uh, you don't need to concern yourself with that, but we do need to have that clear on the record so somebody's not looking for those exhibits in the future if they look at the case file. So uh, with that noted, uh, Mr. Wood, if you'd like to continue at this time with direct examination, you may. The court would note all parties are present and the defendant as well. And you can uh, continue to question your witness. Thank you. And just for clarity of the record, with the next exhibit, I will, as we ad admit it, uh, there will be a few uh, similar items. So, Okay. Dr. Warren, when we left, we had briefly discussed uh, your finding of a cause of homicide by unspecified means. That's correct. And you were discussing criteria uh, for uh, for reaching that conclusion. Yes. And uh, just to refresh the memory of the jury and everyone, can you can you tell us again what is the criteria for a homicide by unspecified means? Yes. So I already discussed. Um, that this term is um, used or sometimes used as a cause of death. So that there are specific guidelines and criteria that are used uh, dealing with this cause of death. Um, one, it has to be objectively uh, suspicious circumstances. And examples used for the guidelines are dismembered body, um, body is burned, um, body is um, buried out of sight, um, and there's some other ones as well, but this case clearly fits number one. Uh, number two would be no findings at autopsy to explain the death. So it gives a couple um, examples. 
One is if you have a full body that's intact and you do an autopsy and there's no other cause of death to explain it based on your autopsy. Another example would be that there's not enough of the body present to determine the cause of death by way of autopsy. Uh, so that, in this particular case, that would fit uh, uh, number two. Uh, number three would be toxicology. There's no toxicology. Uh, that would explain the decedent's death. In this case, the, the toxicology, uh, I found no drugs or substances that would explain the decedent's death. Uh, number four would is more on the social slash um, history, uh, including medical records. There's not another reasonable explanation uh, based on medical records, social records, um, why somebody should be or could be dead. Um, so in this particular case, I felt like this felt all the, met all the criteria, and that's why I called it as such. Again, it's homicide by unspecified means, meaning I believe, based on everything, that all the circumstances, autopsy, toxicology, uh, all the supporting documents, that this is a homicide. I just can't tell you exactly why. I can't pinpoint it. Doctor, did you review Tyler Ryan's medical records? I did. Uh, and in reviewing... What did you find in her uh, medical records in terms of prior illnesses or, or sicknesses? So based on the medical records that were available to me, um, Ty Lee uh, was documented to have anxiety uh, with uh, panic attacks. Uh, she was documented to have ovarian cysts that sometimes caused her pain. Uh, she was documented to have uh, pancreatitis or recurrent pancreatitis. Uh, in her case, it often, uh, her pancreatitis often flared up uh, when she took antibiotics. But um, there was, I, I believe that in the medical records too, there's mention of an autoimmune, possible autoimmune reason for pancreatitis. There's wide wide variety of reasons to have pancreatitis. Um, and then also she's known to have mesenteric adenitis, which, which would also cause her abdominal pain. So mesenteric adenitis is essentially uh, your loops of bowel you have are held together with adipose tissue. And within that adipose tissue, there's numerous lymph nodes. So typically during a viral infection, your lymph nodes will get inflamed, they'll become enlarged, it'll cause pain. Um, it's usually self-limited. Um, and I believe those were, um, at least based on the medical records that I reviewed, that was part of her medical history. Okay, and is there anything in her medical history that would provide a reasonable explanation for her death? No, not in my opinion. As part of your uh, your examination of Tyree Ryan, uh, did you collect any evidence to be sent to other labs? Yes. What was that? So I think we already mentioned uh, that I sent skeletal muscle for toxicology, and we already talked about those results. Um, in addition to that, I collected multiple um, pieces of soft tissue, uh, skeletal muscle, what I thought was liver, um, and other organs for potential DNA analysis. So you, you can use blood, you can use tissue samples, and you can potentially get DNA from those sources. Um, there was also a strand of hair in bag number two, I talked about how there were three bags uh, that uh, the remains came in. In bag number two of three, there was a single strand of hair, so we submitted that to law enforcement. Um, and there's also in, uh, I believe, bag number 
to there was a, a green bucket, a melted green bucket, uh, and that was submitted to law enforcement uh, as evidence as well. Dr. Warren, did you, as part of this autopsy, uh, were photographs taken? Yes. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be shown. State's Exhibit 177A through 177EE. Doctor, can you review States Exhibit 177A through EE and let me know when you've had a chance to look over it? Yes. Okay. Do you recognize states exhibit exhibits uh, 177A through EE? Yes. What are they? These are photographs uh, taken at the time of the autopsy by our office. Okay. And were you were present during uh, that autopsy? Yes. And were some of those photographs even taken under your supervision? Yes. Okay. Uh, and do you recognize those photographs? photographs as true and accurate representations of what you witnessed that day? Yes. Your Honor, I'd move for admission of State's, exhibit, states Exhibits 177A through EE into evidence. Any objection from the defense? Yes, Your Honor, we would object that <clears throat> under Rule 403, uh, these are more prejudicial than probative. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. I've considered that objection. Uh, the court does need to consider whether or not the probative value of the exhibits is sufficient to overcome any possible inflammatory effect that may be had on the jury. The court does find that there is a probative value that outweighs the inflammatory nature of what these may show. So on the grounds of 403, the court determines that the objection is overruled. I'll note, however, though, Mr. Wood, that is with the previous photographs, there are 
some photographs in here, not all of them, that I would determine in order to minimize the inflammatory effect that they could potentially have should not be displayed on the large projector screen, may be shown on the smaller monitors for the jurors. And for that reason, um, I think we've already indicated which ones I believed shouldn't be shown on the projector. Uh, apologies for the delay that may create, but we'll need to reconfigure the displays and projectors when we get to that point. Okay. Um, are the, is that exhibit admitted? It is. Okay. Your Honor, and just for clarity, uh, for the record, if I may now uh, list, there's a few numbers that are not in there. Okay. So we went A through EE, -E, which I presume is A through Z, then starting with double A through double E. Yes. And what is not included in that exhibit? There is no 177L, 177N, as in November, 177R, 177U, 177W, and 177Y. Okay. And again, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, don't be concerned necessarily with numbers or lettering. Once you get exhibits, you'll be just uh, instructed to consider all the evidence. So with that, Mr. Wood, you can continue. I think, Your Honor, your, uh, your clerk did, I think, briefly show us uh, the exhibits you did not want shown on the, the large screen. I'm, I'm wondering if I could get a copy of that so I don't inadvertently. Okay. The list I've got is D through H of 177 is the first set. If you're going sequentially through the, or alphabetically through the listing. We will be. Okay. The second group then, Mr. Wood, is um, I believe it's O through CC. Uh, may I begin to publish and then we'll... Yes. Thank you. Doctor, can you describe for the jury what you observed in States Exhibit 177A? Yes, as I mentioned... Uh, the remains um, came in three separate uh, bags. So this is labeled one of three, and you can see there's a red seal um, through the zippers of the bag. Again, the, the seal is for to preserve evidence. Okay. And was there a number assigned uh, to Ty Ryan's case or autopsy for... For your lab? Yes. Uh, as, same with JJ. Uh, there's a ruler with the case number 200611-61, and this is the number that was assigned to uh, Ty Lee's case. Okay. And can you describe what's in States Exhibit B? This is simply a, a close-up of the seal uh, with number 506600, showing that it's intact. Okay. Can you describe what uh, what you observed in States Exhibit 177C? So after we broke the seal and opened the bag, um, within the body bag, uh, there were large clumps of uh, soft tissue and bone uh, and dirt, and there were also two brown paper bags. You can see one of them is labeled with burial site, question mark, and the other bag was unlabeled.
Your Honor, I'm to 177D. Okay. For that next set, then, I would require that, again, for purposes of not making the exhibits unnecessarily inflammatory, that they not be projected onto the monitor. So, and there are two groups. If you want to keep it in order, I guess we'll reconfigure twice to do that, but we'll need to turn off the projector at this point. That's what I was going to have, Okay, we're ready to proceed. Thanks, everyone, for your assistance. Doctor, can you describe uh, what you observed in States Exhibit 177D? Yes, so we're still on bag one of three. Um, the previous photo showed you the two brown paper bags. Uh, the rest of what was in the bag is what you see. Um, it's essentially charred remains of uh, clumps of mud and dirt, soft tissue, uh, and bone. Okay. And can you tell the jury what you observed in 177E? So this is a photograph of what was in that uh, commingled uh, clump of charred tissue. Once we were able to clean off uh, the debris and the most of the decomposed tissue, um, what we have here is on the right side that's not on the blue board. Uh, we have to your far left, that's a sacrum with decomposed tissue and, and blackened charring. And then the other two bones, the middle and the right bones, that's the right and left hip bone uh, with, with a small fragment of femur that's still attached to both of them. And you can still see there is uh, blackened, charred appearance to portions of the bone, and there still is some decomposed tissue uh, that's adherent to the bone. Uh, on the blue board with the ruler, on your far left, uh, those are two small fragments of small bowel that uh, we found within the commingled remains. Um, next in line, 
uh, directly above the sticker that says bag one of three, those are vertebral bodies uh, from the vertebral column. And moving next, uh, the small fragments of tissue, um, uh, two of those are small fragments of essentially unidentified, not sure where the bone came from, but it's small, probably, probably hand or foot. And then there's some small fragments of cartilage as well. Okay. So that was essentially, this is the cleaned up version of what you just saw in the previous photo. Doctor, are you aware if any of these items were sent for further testing with the FBI? Yes, all the skeletal remains were sent to the FBI for a forensic anthropology workup. Okay. Can you explain what you observed, observed in States Exhibit 177F? So this is still bag one of three. Uh, this is on your left, right again, right above the ruler with the sticker bag one of three. Uh, that was what was determined to be, to the best of my ability, uh, charred and decomposed soft tissue. On the right, uh, the blackened uh, chunks of tissue uh, or I'm sorry, chunks of material, that was determined to be, those were charred uh, clumps of mud, um, uh, just ash and rock. And can you describe for the jury what you observed in States Exhibit 177G? So if you remember, we're still on bag one of three. If you remember, the burial site question mark was within bag one of three. And this is what was in the uh, paper bag burial site, burial site question mark. Um, you can see it came in a foil container. Um, and there's multiple charred pieces of, of bone and other debris. Uh, you can make out to the on the far left, um, those are vertebral bodies. Uh, the remainder of the bones were just small, fragmented bones that were charred. And can you state what you observed, or tell the jury what you observed in States Exhibit 177H? Yes. So this is the cleaned up version of what you just saw within that container. Uh, on the far left are two vertebral columns uh, or body, vertebral bodies uh, that are charred and uh, partially burned away. Uh, in the middle, there's those three fragments of small uh, bones uh, that have some um, uh, thermal artifact as well. Uh, in the bottom right, uh, that black material, that was determined to be more just charred ash, dirt, uh, twigs, and rock. Um, and then up in the upper right, those are just small fragments of unidentified bone that were charred. State what you, Your Honor, I don't know if the court wanted to turn the projector back on. How wants to do that? Okay. There are um, a series of four more that um, can be displayed on the projector. Actually, three more. It might be. Mr. Wood, why don't you just keep going since. There's only actually two or three more that I think shouldn't be on the projector, and then once we get through the rest of that other set, we'll convert things back to normal. Very well. Thank you. Thank you. Can you state for the jury what you observed in States Exhibit 177K? Yes. So as I mentioned, uh, 
three bags were received. We just went over bag one of three and the contents of bag one of three, and now we're moving on to the second bag, bag two of three. Okay. What did you observe in State's Exhibit 177I? This is just uh, another photograph of how the body bag was received. Uh, body bag two of three is a suspected female. Okay. And 177J? That is the body lock uh, with seal number 506564, just showing that it's intact. Can you state what you observed in State's Exhibit 177M? So this is once we uh, broke the seal, opened the bag, and this is looking at one portion of what we saw uh, within bag two of three. And you can see there are just large masses and large clumps of you know, at this point, it's hard to tell, but you can tell that there is clumps of tissue. Uh, you can you can feel the bone. Um, you can also see um, if you can see some green. I'm not sure if you're aware if you can see that, but on the f the largest uh, mass of of commingled tissue, there there's some green discoloration. Um, and that was the green melted bucket that I was talking about. And just for clarity, doctor, where I'm pointing my pen, is that part of what you're referencing? Yes. And is this part of what you're referencing? Yes. Okay. And what did you observe in States Exhibit 1770? So this is all also within bag two of three. So you can see there's more black and charred uh, masses of tissue and debris and rock and dirt. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, there's two brown paper bags. One of them is sealed with white tape. That's the far left bag. And then there's another brown paper bag that's enclosed within a clear plastic bag. And that's at the top of the screen. And what did you observe in States Exhibit 177P? So after sifting and partially cleaning through uh, the debris and the uh, remains, uh, this is a portion of what we found. Uh, the most, at the top of the screen, that's the frontal bone. So that's the top of the skull. And you can see semicircular uh, rounding off at the bottom of the skull, so that, that would be the top of your orbit. So um, that's where your, your essentially your eyeballs would be. So it, it's the, the top of the head. You can see there's some charring. Uh, there's some dirt still on it. Um, to Just to your left, on the far left, that's another large fragment and cranium. Uh, so that's a, a large... A fragment of skull that has significant charring and blackening secondary to the fire. And the most bottom uh, piece of tissue is uh, a portion of the uh, mandible and maxilla. Um, you, can s you can still see that there are teeth, um, if you can recognize it. Um, significantly blackened and charred. Uh, but there were still some teeth that were uh, intact. And can you uh, tell the jury what you observed in 177Q? So as we mentioned before, there were some organs that were identified within that, uh, the remains. 
So this is the heart right in the middle. And then on both sides of the heart are the right and left lung. So they're still attached to one another. You can see the great vessels. Um, they look like straws come, kind of coming uh, out. Uh, so th those are some of the great vessels that come off the aorta. And now this is not what a normal heart and lung looks like, just so you know. Uh, this is significantly shrunken. The heart and the lungs are both significantly shrunken. Uh, they're disrupted, they're charred, they're burned, they're falling apart. Um, and so that was what was found, uh, at least part of the organs that were found. And what did you observe and do in States Exhibit 177S? So again, this is just a little different view. Although the tissue, the organs are significantly obscured due to thermal injury and decomposition, you still do your best to uh, try to rule out any kind of disease process or any kind of injury. Uh, so right there in the middle, the largest piece, that is the heart. You can see it's there's uh, significant charring, uh, there's decomposition, it's kind of falling apart. And then on the right side, that's the right lung that's been sectioned serially. And on the left side, that's the left lung that's been sectioned serially. So again, the lungs are significantly shrunken. Uh, the outsides are blackened and charred. Um, and there's thermal artifact uh, within the middle of the organs. Uh, basically, your lung is typically nice and soft. Um, it had become to the point where it was like a very hard sponge. And what did you observe in States Exhibit 177T? So as mentioned earlier, one kidney was identified, and this is that kidney. Uh, very similar to the heart and the lungs. It was extremely shrunken. It was blackened. It was charred. Significant heat thermal artifact. But that's essentially it. And you, can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 177V? So this is bag two of three after it's been cleaned up. Um, so the organs are not in there, the organs that we just went over, the heart, lungs, and so forth. But these are all the bones uh, that we're able to uh, sift away and clean. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the top right corner, uh, you can see there's these larger, flatter bones, um, and that's part of the, the skull. Um, you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, uh, there's a scapula. There's some long bones, including the uh, tibia and fibula from the lower leg. Uh, some of the bones in the middle right b below uh, one of the large skull fragments, there's multiple rib fragments. Um, just to the left, I don't know if you can see, it's, it's at the very top to the left. Uh, it's a sternum with multiple ribs coming off of it. I believe there's one, two, three, four, five uh, ribs coming off one side and two ribs coming off another side. Doctor, to clarify, is this what you're speaking about, where my pen is pointed? Yes. Okay. And then there are multi multiple other just black and charred bones that are essentially unre unrecognizable. Um, and then even further to your left um, are some smaller hand or foot bones, um, as well as burnt soft tissue or charred soft tissue in your very upper left. So basically what you're looking at is after a week of sifting through uh, bag two of three that you saw earlier, that's, those are the bones and the, the soft tissue uh, that we recovered.
Can you describe uh, what you observed in States Exhibit 177X? So if you remember, there were two brown paper bags within bag two of three as well. So within that paper bag, you can see on the left, there are multiple charred pieces of bone, um, unrecognizable bone, um, most likely at the very top, those small, kind of they look like little logs. Those are likely hand or foot bones. Um, and that was what, what was in the, the brown paper bag. Doctor, can you describe States Exhibit 177Z? So that was, we've completed bag two of three. Now we're moving on to bag three of three. Uh, this is a little different. The, the first two bags came in black body bags that were sealed. This came in a sealed large brown paper bag. Uh, and with in this brown paper bag, there were five smaller uh, uh, paper envelopes uh, that came within this bag three of three. All right. <clears throat> Mr. Wood, at this point, we can continue to just project these regularly if you'd like going forward. Sure. We'll take a moment to reconfigure. doing that, I'll again mention that the victims will have an opportunity if they wish to view the photographic evidence. I'll allow the state to submit a request and we'll arrange for that. Doctor, can you describe what's in State's Exhibit 177AA? Yes, so within bag three of three, as I mentioned, there were five other smaller paper bags. This is one of them, and it has identification information, including fire pit A Northwest. Do you recall what was in that bag? Yes, in this bag and also moving forth with the four other bags, they're essentially just small fragments of unide unidentifiable charred bone. You identify States Exhibit 177BB. So this was a second bag that was received within bag three of three. It's sealed and labeled with identification information, including fire pit B. Okay, and what was in, uh, you may have already stated it, but just for purposes of clarity for the record, what was in this bag? So there were small fragments of charred, unrecognizable bone. Can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 177CC? Yes, so this is a third bag within bag three of three, again with identification information. I think this, the description was suspected bone fragment. Okay. And do you recall what was in it? Again, a small uh, charred pieces of unrecognizable bone. And I, when I mean unrecognizable, they were they were bone. I just couldn't say where they came from because they were so small and uh, charred and fragmented. And state, uh, can you tell the jury what you observed in States Exhibit 177D? I'm Again, sorry, let me restate that. 
177DD. So this is a fourth paper bag within the bag three of three, again, labeled and sealed with the description suspected bone fragments. And within this bag was also small, charred, uh, crumbly, unre unrecognizable pieces of bone. Okay. And can you describe what you observed in States Exhibit 177EE? -E? This is the final fifth bag uh, that is sealed uh, with identification information and uh, labeled suspected, suspected organic matter. Uh, so within this bag, there was small charred fragments of soft tissue. Were you able to identify those pieces of tissue? No. Just one moment, Your Honor. Your Honor, the state has no further questions at this time. All right, thank you, Mr. Wood. <clears throat> Who will be conducting cross? I will judge. All right, Mr. Thomas, you can commence with your cross examination. Good afternoon, Dr. Warren. Good afternoon. Um, so it looks like you're a forensic pathologist, correct? That's correct. So where did you, uh, I think you said you got your medical degree in Denver? Correct, the University of uh, Colorado. Okay. Um, and where did you do your undergraduate work? I went to Stanford University. Okay. And when was that? 1998 to 2002. Okay. Any other uh, postgraduate work other than going to medical school? Other than, and we've already gone over this, but my res general pathology residency, neuropathology fellowship, forensic uh, pathology fellowship, um, and that's it. Where, where were those done? So the general pathology was done at Oregon Health and Sciences University in Portland, Oregon. Uh, the neuropathology fellowship was at the same place. I just stayed stayed there for another two years. And then for my forensic pathology fellowship, I went back to Denver uh, for the forensic fellowship. Okay. Now you... you uh talked a little bit about forensic pathology and what it is, and I believe you said that um, in a nutshell you try to figure out why people die. Is that right? Correct. Okay. Um, you currently work at the Ada County Coroner's Office, right? Yes. That's not necessarily an, or that's not an arm of uh, law enforcement, right? That's correct. Okay. You're kind of an independent uh, office you don't work with law enforcement necessarily, right? I would say I don't work for them, but work with them often. Okay. All right. Um, and in this particular case, uh, well, well, I guess when I say, when you say you work with them, what does that mean? You are not an independent, you don't, you don't look at this case, each body, you don't look at it independently, you kind of look at it with a, an eye towards law enforcement? No. So we're our own independent agency, the Ada County Coroner's Office. We perform our own death investigation independent of other agencies. 
Uh, but in case of suspicious cases, homicide cases, um, we obviously rely upon information. You can't do an autopsy in a black box, right? You can't do an abasement with no information. Uh, so we often rely upon information from law enforcement uh, to help us um, determine the cause of matter of death. Okay. Uh, and so you say you do somewhere between 200 and 250 autopsies a year? Correct. And about 20 of those or 10 percent of those are, are homicide or some sort of uh, suspicious circumstances? Yes. All right. Um, and the state said that you, uh, the prosecutor said that uh, you have some sort of a contract with Fremont and Madison County. Is that right? That's correct. And you are to determine the cause of death, and they are to determine the manner of death. That's correct. Okay. So when you do these uh, suspicious circumstances deaths, um, do you have any – well, let me back up. I'll withdraw that portion of it. Uh, when, do you have any specific training uh, on the collection of evidence that you turn over to the police? Through my training, yes. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your training uh, about with collection of evidence. Tell me about that. So during your forensic pathology training, you perform a number of homicides. I think even in fellowship, you, you're required to do, I believe, at least 20. So during that time, you are, at least in my fellowship, um, you're trained on how to get nail swabs and fingernail clippings or <clears throat> getting the clothing off the body or doing anal, vaginal, oral swabs and so forth. Um, so it's really um, just based off experience and, and doing uh, evidence collection that where you get most of your, your training. Okay. So you don't have any specific training from law enforcement on how to collect trace evidence? No. Do you know what trace evidence is? Yes, trace evidence that you can, like a piece of hair. Okay. That's, that's one example of trace evidence. Okay. Um, and so who, when you're doing these suspicious death autopsies, I mean, I've um, done a number of murder cases, and so I kind of know the routine, but I don't know that the jury knows. So why don't you tell me a little bit about who's in the room when you're doing this autopsy. You're not doing it alone. There's obviously a photographer, right? Correct. Okay, who else? So it really varies. If it's, say, a natural, well, I guess we're talking about suspicious death where law enforcement is there or may be there. Oftentimes, in this case, uh, for example, there was, I was obviously there. Uh, there were three autopsy technicians from the 80 counties coroner's office who were there who helped me with the autopsy. Um, there was the uh, the prosecutor, uh, Rob Wood, was there on that day. Um, there were two Rexburg um, Police Department detectives that were there. The Fremont County coroner was there, and a Fremont County detective was there. Okay. And who was in charge of collecting the trace evidence that was found on the body. Was that your job? Yes. So um, ever since I've been at Ada County, it's essentially been the role of the forensic pathologist to collect evidence off the body. So say there's a, a scene and um, there's a body at a scene. So at, at that point, be law enforcement um, is going to collect evidence on the scene and then once the body gets transported to our office, it has always been the responsibility of the forensic pathologist to collect evidence off the body. Okay. And once you uh, – is there anybody there, a police officer, a prosecutor, anybody who's saying, hey, I want you to collect that, or are you just kind of in your zone and they're just there to watch you do your thing? No, it's a, it's a collective – um, I think it's a team approach. It's There are certain things that we typically always get. Um, 
the, if we can on suspicious cases, we 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 always try to get fingernail swabs, hand swabs, oral swabs. If there's any kind of sexual uh, to the anything sexual to the case, we'll get vaginal swabs or anal swabs or penile swabs. Uh, we always give the clothing and submit it to law enforcement. Um, but there is also an element of uh, sometimes law enforcement will ask for specific things, like I want this. All right. Can and you I, do that? I guess in this particular case, that's what I, want. I don't want to talk about generalities. I just want to talk about what happened in this particular case, okay? Right. So tell me about uh, any conversations you may have had with law enforcement or uh, the prosecutor here, Mr. Wood, or uh, anybody that was in the room as to what they wanted you to gather as far as evidence. I don't think I can recall exactly what was said. It was three years ago. Right. Um, was this recorded? No. You don't video record? No. You don't audio record? No. Okay. So it's just your word, whatever happens. Okay. So tell us about what do you remember uh, being directed to collect as far as trace evidence? So I imagine um, we had a discussion, and we would say... Well, I want you to imagine. I want you to focus in on this particular case if you can. Right. And focus in and say, this is what I remember happening. Okay, so what I, what I remember happening, uh, talking about what evidence would you like collected, um, we always collect clothing, fingernails, so I'm sure those are all part of it. Um, and then in this case, there were some other things. We'd obviously want to collect uh, the paper bag and the duct tape and the bag that the body came in with duct tape. Um, so I'm sure all of those things were discussed. Okay. So you're saying these are things you generally do, and so this is what you probably did, but you don't have any specific recollection of having any conversations with anyone on that particular day about the evidence that was collected. Yeah, I think that's safe to say. Okay. Um, and now, by the time these bodies were collected and brought to you, uh, there were a number of theories going around. What was told to you as far as the background um, that led you to uh, come up with the cause of death here on J.J. Vallow? Uh, for J.J. Vallow, uh, we did have a briefing before the autopsy. Uh, met with law enforcement uh, from Rexburg, uh, from Fremont, and there was an individual from the FBI there as well. And I essentially, I remember, I got a uh, timeline of what what they knew at that point, um, kind of leading up to when um, they disappeared to when they were found. Uh, so I essentially got a general guideline, or timeline, I'm sorry, of, of the events that had happened up to that point. Okay. So now you mentioned that uh, Fremont County Sheriff's Office was there, Rexburg Police Department was there, and now you indicate that there was an, also an FBI agent that was there? That's correct. At least one, or more than one? There's one. Okay. You don't recall his name or her name? I don't. Okay. Male or female, do you know? It is male. Okay. Um, so you indicated the cause of death on JJ was, well, I don't want to get this wrong. Why don't you go ahead and tell me what it was? It was asphyxia by plastic bag over the head and duct tape covering the mouth. Right. Plastic bag over the head. So tell me what evidence... Um, did you collect, did you collect any evidence um, inside the sinuses? Did you swab the sinuses and pull out any evidence? No. Okay. Did you um, swab the throat or go down the throat somehow and swab anything down there? Yes, we took oral swabs. Okay. And did you find any evidence of uh, microplastics or something that might be consistent with someone being smothered with a plastic bag? Well, I wouldn't expect to find that, but no, we didn't find anything. Okay, so how is it that you're coming to the conclusion that this person was smothered with a plastic bag? Right. So 
um, going back, so JJ was found with a plastic bag over his head um, that was duct taped tightly. He was bound. There was evidence of a struggle, and there was no other explanation of why he was dead. So it was a rule out. I wouldn't consider a rule out because there's a plastic bag over his head. Okay, but that plastic bag could have been put over his head post mortem, right? I guess that's possible. Okay. But you're saying that your conclusion is, is that it was done anti mortem prior Correct. to his death. Correct. And that's based on n nothing concrete, just your theory of the way you think the crime may have happened. No. I think. Essentially, that's how an autopsy um, and all the tests, uh, that's why you do all of those things. So you have a person with a plastic bag over their head and it's bound, and you do all the tests and you do the autopsy and you find zero reason for them to be dead, then it's reasonable to conclude that that was the cause of death. Okay, but you, let's, let's back up a little bit. When I talked about swabbing the sinuses or swabbing the nasal cavity, you didn't do that? I've never heard anybody doing that in this type of situation. Okay. What type of situation are you talking about? Uh, bag over the head. Okay. So when someone has a bag over their head and they are, and I'm just going off of things I've seen in movies and whatnot, it seems That's like... scary. It's scary to you? Yeah. But you're going off movies. Okay. So, well, you're going off of... Uh, off of... My knowledge. Knowledge. Okay. So when someone puts a bag over their head... And they're trying to breathe in air. Is that correct? What, yes. When, how this happens? Yes. Okay. Does does anything that's inside that bag does it generally go inside the nasal cavity or inside the mouth or down the throat? I've never heard of that. That's not how it works. No, not with the plastic bag. Tell me how it how, Tell me how it works. Essentially, the bag put is put over your head and you can't breathe, and then you go unconscious and you die. Okay. So nothing goes into the nasal cavity. I don't know why it would. What are you breathing in? Air. From where? Nowhere. From That's inside, why you die. From inside the plastic bag? Correct. Okay. So anything that may have been inside that plastic bag that was close to the mouth or nose would have gone inside the mouth or nose? Not necessarily, okay. no. All right. I guess we'll just have to disagree on that. Objection. That's not a question. Sustained. Will we have to disagree on that? I guess we will. All right. Thank you. So you turned JJ from face up to to face down, uh, and did you collect any trace evidence that was on the on his back, or his buttocks, or his legs? Yes, we obtained anal swabs. Okay, but there was no there were no uh, hairs, loose hairs, or anything that uh, or, or other swabs other than the uh, anal swabs. Other than that, you didn't take any swabs. No, there was no trace evidence that I found uh, to swab. That you could see? Correct. With the naked eye? Yes. Okay. The bruising that was on JJ's arms, you indicated that that was anti-mortem or prior to his death? Correct. Okay. So um, how soon prior to the other, how likely is it that this was done in contemporaneously or contemporaneously with the death, like at the same time? That's a good question. Um, so you can't really look at a bruise and date it specifically. Um, they even done tests where you look at it microscopically and it's not real great. Um, so all I can really say is that the bruising looked recent, it was fresh, it was red-purple um, within the soft tissues. 
Um, usually if it's a heat healing type bruise, even even though he's decomposed within the soft tissues, you'd expect different discoloration, maybe some healing. But it looked recent, um, so that's all I can really say. I can't say if it was right at the time of his death or shortly prior or how shortly prior, but it was. It looked pretty fresh. Pretty fresh being within days, right? Oh, no. I, I think that's probably a little too far out. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't say for certain. It was probably right around the time if there was a struggle or um, shortly before. So within the day? Or hours. Or hours. Thank you. Nothing further. All right. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Any redirect from the state, Mr. Wood? No, Your Honor. All right. That will conclude the testimony then of uh, this witness. Can Dr. Warren be excused from any subpoena? May he be recalled? Uh, I believe he can be released. Any objection to his release from the defense? If I could have just a second, Judge. Yes. Judge, we may recall him, so we're not going to, uh, we're going to ask that he not be released from his speed at this time. All right. So, Dr. Warren, then please uh, maintain contact uh, with whoever issued the subpoena while the trial is still pending. You could be recalled. Uh, based on that, I'd also advise you to not view any trial testimony between now and the finish of the trial, just in case you are recalled. With that, you can be excused as a witness for today. Um, so, we'll have you step down, but before we do that, I guess it looks like a good time for us to take our mid-afternoon break. So we'll go ahead and take a break, and then will the state be calling another witness after that? Yes, Your Honor. Who's your next witness going to be? Dr. Christensen. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Wood. We'll go ahead and take our break then for 20 minutes. All right, please. Thank you. Please be seated. <laughs> Have the jurors brought in, please. Thank you, Mr. Bailiff. Please be seated.
Okay, we're back on the record on CR 22-21-1624, State of Idaho versus Lori Noreen Vallow, continuing the state's case in chief. The state can call its next witness. Um, Your Honor, the state will call um, Dr. Christensen, Angie Christensen. All right, as we get started, I'll just have a preliminary question or two for the witness. Dr. Christensen, now that you've been sworn, let me ask you, have you uh, reviewed, listened to, or in any way seen any of the testimony that's occurred in this trial since it started? No, I have not. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, with that in mind, I'll ask you to please make sure to sit forward and talk right into that microphone to make sure we pick up your voice on the recording. We're making a court record as well, so please make verbal responses to any questions you're asked, and please try to avoid talking at the same time as any attorney that's questioning you. So with those rules in mind, Ms. Smith, if you'd like to inquire on direct, you can do so. Thank you, Your Honor. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Will you please introduce yourself to the ladies and gentlemen of the jury and then spell your last name? My name is Angie Christensen, and Angie is spelled A-N-G-I. Christensen is C-H-R-I-S-T-E-N-S-E-N. -E -E okay. Now, ma'am, are, uh, are you a doctor? So should I call you Dr. Christensen? Yes, I have a PhD. Okay. Um, ma'am, uh, can you tell us a little bit about what you do for a living? I am a forensic anthropologist at the FBI laboratory in Quantico, Virginia, where I've worked since 2004. Okay. Ma'am, uh, can you tell us about your educational background, please? I have a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, and a PhD, all in the area of anthropology. Okay. And uh, what is your educational background? Uh, uh, for what schools? Um, my undergraduate was from the University of Washington, and both my master's and PhD from the University of Tennessee. Okay. Do you hold any certificates? Yes, I am certified by the American Board of Forensic Anthropology and the Forensic Anthropology Society of Europe. Um, and uh, the Forensic Anthropology Society of Europe, how many people are allowed to be in that society? Uh, I'm not aware of how many are certified in that society. Okay. Um, just generally, what is anthropology? Anthropology is a very broad science that includes the study of humans um, and humanity in any way. So human language, culture, biology is a very broad discipline. Okay. Um, and uh, are you a forensic anthropologist, you said? Yes. What is forensic anthropology? Forensic anthropology is a specialized area of anthropology that includes the examination and analysis of skeletal remains in forensic or death investigation contexts. Okay. And that is your occupation at the FBI at Quantico? Yes. Okay. And uh, just so that the jury's uh, clear, what is the difference between forensic um, pathology and forensic anthropology? They are related and complementary, but different disciplines. Forensic anthropology, as I mentioned, emphasizes analysis of the human skeleton specifically. Um, and forensic anthropologists are not authorized to determine cause and manner of death or to make a positive identification. So why would a medical examiner refer um, human remains or skeletal remains to a forensic anthropologist? Typically, if they're wanting a more in-depth examination of any um, features of the skeleton specifically. And so if a, a medical examiner wanted an in-depth analysis of skeletal marine, uh, remains, what sort of um, process, if there is a general process, would one go through in doing such an examination? A forensic anthropology examination is pretty, it can be pretty varied and depends a lot on what exactly is submitted and what type of examination is being requested. 
But generally speaking, an examination will begin with a visual assessment of the bones, looking for which bones are present, uh, their general condition, and things like that. Um, that might then progress to things like looking at bones under a microscope, uh, taking measurements, or taking x-rays. Okay. Now, um, w were you involved in a laboratory number, um, and I believe an FBI number, HQA329029? Yes, I was. Um, and was that um, your internal lab number, 2020-01332? Yes, that's correct. And that was referred to the um, FBI Quantico by um, the Ada County uh, uh, coroner? Yes, they're the ones who made the request to the laboratory. And they sent some human marine remains for their case number 200611. Yes. All right. And those photos have already been admitted, Your Honor, as the photos um, from the autopsy of uh, Tylee uh, uh, Lyon. Um, are you aware that those um, remains have since been identified? Yes. Okay. And um, are you aware that those remains have since you looked at them been identified as Tylee Ryan? Um, I, I may have learned this information at some point in the investigation, but I don't recall specifically when. In this specific case, um, specific process, what methods did you use? Specifically in this case, I did that initial visual assessment. Um, I did take some measurements of the bones. I looked at some of the items microscopically, and I took CT scans, which are a three-dimensional x-ray. Um, do you have an idea of how many bone bone fragments you received from the Ada County Corridor um, that turned out to be some of the remains of Tylee Ryan? I don't recall the exact number, but somewhere in the ballpark of 100 or more. Okay. Was there any um, de uh, decomposing tissue or any tissue with it? Some of the skeletal um, remains or bones did have some soft tissue still attached. And in your position as a forensic anthropologist, do you work with or analyze tissue? Skel well, skeletal tissue is technically a tissue, but it is a hard tissue. And I do not work with soft tissues such as skin, muscle, and organs. Okay. So um, let me ask uh, if you know, um, if the remains you received were all from one single person, do you have any idea of what percentage of the body you received in terms of the skeletal remains? Because of the condition of the remains in this case, which were fragmentary, I, I don't know the exact uh, proportion, but all major parts of the skeleton were represented. So, for example, parts of the cranium, parts of the thorax, and parts of the arms and legs. Okay. Um, turning to your specific analysis in uh, this situation, um, let me ask that you be shown uh, two exhibits for reference, states exhibits 182A and 182B, both of which have previously been given to both defense counsel and the court. Thank you, sir. Um, Ma'am, do you recognize these? Yes. Okay. What are they? And if you could, is, what is Exhibit 182A? Uh, 182A is a schematic or just a general depiction of a, a generalized human skeleton. Okay. And what is one it states Exhibit 182B? 182B is a, um, a a portion of that same schematic focusing on the pelvic region. Okay. And are both of those? Um, a fairly and accurately depiction of the general layout of the skeletal of human skeletal outline of a general human skeletal outline. Yes. Okay. Move for the admission um, for states exhibit 182A and 182B. Any objection? No objection, Judge. <clears throat> Exhibits 182A and 182B are admitted. Okay. Thank you, sir. Okay. We'll come to these in a minute. Um, now, ma'am, when you did the review of the remains that you were provided, let's just... Honor, uh, I'm sorry. I apologize, Ms. Smith. We're, we're omitting these just for demonstrative evidence, right? They're not the actual skeletal, skeletons of, of anybody that we know of. I think it's an important distinction that they are 
I would consider demonstrative exhibits since they don't relate to any particular person in this case. Thank you. I apologize. Thank you, Judge. Yeah, no, that's your problem. Um, and I, if I neglected to say that, I apologize. Very well. Um, now, turning to um, the specific examination that you did, what were your general observations of the um, uh, skeletal remains and remains you received? The material I received was fragmentary in nature for the most part. Uh, there were many parts of the skeleton that were thermally altered or exposed to some sort of heat or burned. Uh, I also identified three bones with sharp trauma or alterations that were produced by a instrument or tool with a uh, small surface area, such as a bevel or point. Um, now, let's talk briefly. Was there any evidence that some of the bones were hinged or bent? Yes, I believe there. Might I be able to refer to a copy of my notes? Absolutely. If court she, judge, she provided the state as she walked in a copy of her notes that she might need to refresh her recollection. Um, maybe she'd be given those. Yes. I'm going to need to see those prior to. Ma'am, if you need, there's water up there. I appreciate it. I brought some too. Thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you. Yes, um, from my review, my report indicates at least one incidence of bone that was hinged or bent. Okay. Um, and does it indicate also that it was perimortem at time at the time? Yes. Okay, what does perimortem mean? Perimortem means at or around the time of death, but it's important to make the distinction that forensic anthropologically, what we refer to as perimortem could extend into the postmortem period. And the reason for that is when we are looking at just the bones and we don't have we're not looking at any of the soft tissues, um, all we can see is how the bone reacts to force. And the bone, if it stays in a, what we call biomechanically fresh state, but basically just in a state that retains moisture and collagen and the things that make bone a bit flexible. Um, if that's preserved <coughs> well enough into part of the postmortem period, the bone reacts exactly the same way. So anthropologically, perimortem could mean, could be right at the time of death, but it could also be after the death event if the bone was still in that biomechanically fresh state. And so when you talk about, by Um, that it could extend into um, uh, the postmortem period. Okay. 
Um, so when you talk about biologically, um, biomechanically fresh state, um, what if a bone was subjected to extreme heat or subjected to and received thermal damage? Could that affect um, that process as well? Yes, that would affect the biomechanical properties of bone, which would make it more brittle. Okay. So um, turning to um, a discussion of uh, was there any evidence that the bone received thermal damage? Yes. Okay. Now, just so that we're clear, what does thermal damage mean? Thermal damage is an alteration to the bone caused by exposure to heat or fire. Okay. Um, how were you able to tell that some of the bones in this case had been subjected to heat or fire? Burning bone does, or burning does a number of things to bone. It changes the color. Um, so bone is naturally a sort of creamy white color. And as it becomes burned, it turns tan and black and eventually white. Um, it also, as I mentioned before, causes the bone to become more brittle. So it fractures more easily. Now, um, in some of the bones, um, did you see evidence that there was a lot of thermal damage? There were some areas that had more thermal alteration than others, yes. Okay. And were there, and were there areas that had less thermal damage? Yes. Some parts of the skeleton had less thermal alterations. And what accounts, what can account for that? Um, when the body burns, there is a typical pattern to the damage that occurs to the bones. And basically what happens is the areas of the skeleton that have less soft tissue protection or less other tissues covering them tend to be burned and exposed first. So the knees, the elbows, these areas with just a little bit of skin covering them. Other parts of, of the skeleton, like those within the torso, are better protected by a lot of tissue and organs and then tend to be altered last by the fire. Okay. Um, and did you take efforts to document the various findings you made? Yes, my findings are in my report. Okay, and did you take uh, photographs? I, yes, the photographs appear in my examination notes. All right. Your Honor, I'd ask that the witness be shown States Exhibit 181A through 181I. Courtesy copy has been given to both the court and the defense. Can you take a look at States Exhibit 181A through I with that and just take a look at them as a group? Do you recognize each of those? Yes, these are photographs I took during my examination. Okay. And these uh, States Exhibit 81. Uh, 181A through I, are they all um, accurate copies of the some of the photographs you took of the bones you examined of Tylee Ryan? Yes. Okay. Um, Your Honor, we'll, we'll of course make an individual record, but at this time for expediency's sake, I move for the admissions of states exhibits 181A through 181I um, uh, and for the witnesses used in um, explaining her testimony. All right, any objection to exhibits 181A through I? May I have water and aid? You may. <clears throat> Doctor, uh, some of these um, photographs have scale, and then some of them also have scale as well as um, numbers with arrows on them. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, and those numbers with arrows on them, those were put on after the photos were taken? Yes, those were used to annotate the photos in order to um, demarcate and differentiate alterations that I observed on the bones. Okay. Uh, I'm going to use a term that um, 
is probably not appropriate, but it, photoshopping, that, that you superimposed the numbers and the arrows, but it didn't do anything to the actual underlying photos. That's correct. Okay. Um, 181D, I'm not sure. There's, there's some photos, and then it looks like there may be something else there. <clears throat> Could you tell me what that is? The color, uh, the black with the yellow and green and red? Yes, all of the images in Exhibit 181D depict um, screen captures of the CT scan or th the 3D x-ray that I took in the laboratory. And that one that's different colors um, is just a different visualizing mechanism that I used within the CT scan software. Okay, but you, you took screenshots of those and that's based on your taking the, um, the CT scans. Yes, so the CT scan is a, is a 3D file, and what's on this page is a, a, a two-dimensional screen capture of a, a particular view of that 3D file. And then if you turn to 181G. Okay, uh, is 181G has three photographs on it, correct? Yes. And the bottom two, are those CT scans? Yes, those are also 2D screen captures of a 3D CT scan. Okay, and then the top one is just a photograph? Correct. Okay. And then 181I. One 181I is a traditional two-dimensional X-ray. Okay, so it's a radiograph? Yes. Okay, and did you do that yourself? Yes. Okay. You know, based on that foundation, I have no objection. All right, thank you, Mr. Thomas. So exhibits 181A through I are all admitted. You want to request permission to display these? You may. Okay. And we'll take them one at a time and ask the doctor to explain on the record what they are. Um, but first, let me ask a quick question. You mentioned some thermal evidence of thermal damage. Did you see any evidence in any of the bones that you had of carnivore activity? Yes, there was one bone that had marks on it that are consistent with what you see when carnivores scavenge or chew on bones. And when you say carnivores, we're talking a dog, a cat, a... A, a meat-eating animal, yes. Okay. Um, let me show you what has been marked as 181A. Do you recognize 181A? Yes. Um, what is it? That is a photograph depicting portions of the left and right femur or thigh bones. Okay. And when you say the left and right femur, why did you take these particular pictures? I take pictures to document everything in my examination. Okay. And you earlier referenced that you'd seen some activity of um, carnivore activity? Yes. Is that depicted in this photograph? It is not. And in my notes, it um, indicates that the this was noted on the trochanter, which is going to be on the back side of what's depicted here in this image. Okay. So in the back side of this bone is where you found the carni carnivore activity? Yes. Okay. Now... For reference sake, maybe people's memory of, of um, anatomy is better than my own, so, but for reference state, let me show you States Exhibit 182A. Do you have the laser pointer up there? Yes. Okay. Can you point to us where um, the bone you just referenced is? Um, the femur is the thigh bone, which is this bone here. Okay. So States Exhibit 181A is an image of both the right and the left femur, correct? Yes. Okay.
Now, you earlier referenced thermal damage to the bones and that you could see discoloration, right? Yes. Okay. Let me show you States Exhibit 181B. What is 181B? This is a photograph that I took depicting three parts of the skull. Okay. And you mentioned thermal damage. Can you, is there a way to show us what you mean by thermal damage in this image? Yes. So on this bone here, which is the right side of the face and upper jawbone, this part um, where you see the blackened area is thermally altered from heat. Okay. Um, and so um, when you received the bones, had they been cleaned or was there dirt on them? My understanding is that they had been partially cleaned at the medical examiner's office. Okay. And did you take steps to further clean these bones? Yes. In some cases where there was still some remaining soft tissue, I removed it in order to be able to examine the bone surface directly. Okay. And why is that uh, important? Because if I'm looking for any alterations or damage to the skeleton, um, I can't see it visually through the soft tissue, so I remove the soft tissue to expose the bone surface. Okay. And so in States Exhibit 181B, um, we're seeing thermal damage, correct? Yes. Do you notice any other items of interest for your analysis? Um, there is also thermal alteration on this part of the upper jawbone and on this portion of the lower jawbone. Okay. Um, and again, you had mentioned to us that sometimes there's thermal damage in some of the bones and sometimes there's not. Is that, again, a, a, a situation where if a part of the bone is protected, it doesn't have the same level of damage? Uh, well, these parts of the skeleton are actually the front part of the face is not very well protected. So it's possible this part wasn't exposed to the fire, but I, I can't account for all of the possible patterns. Okay. Um, but that front part of the face, face was not... Um, did not show the same level or degree of burns that the rest, some of the other bones That's did. That's correct. Okay. Now, um, do you have experience in examining items and bones that have experienced or um, show evidence of trauma? Yes. Okay. Um, what sort of trauma have you observed in bones just generally? Generally, the types of trauma on bone that are, can be categorized are blunt trauma, which is from something with a relatively large surface area moving at a relatively low speed. Um, there's also sharp trauma, which is identified as trauma resulting from impact from an implement with a very small surface area, or such as a bevel or a point, or high-velocity projectile trauma, which is trauma due to a small surface area object moving at a high rate of speed. Okay. Um, in the bones for Tylee Ryan, did you examine them for evidence of the trauma? Yes. Okay. And what sort of trauma, um, if any, did you observe? On three of the bones, I identified sharp trauma. Okay. Which three bones did you identify sharp trauma? That was the left and right anominates, or hip bones, and the sacrum, which is the back of the pelvis or the bottom of the spine. Okay. And for reference purposes, let me show you again um, States Exhibit 182A. Can you point to us on the um, diagram that's up there on 182A and show us generally what you're talking about? Yes. So these are the two hip bones. This is the right side and the left side. And the sacrum is the one right in the middle at the base of the spinal column. Okay. And that's areas where you found evidence of sharp trauma? Yes. Um, something sharp, you know, a knife or a hatchet or something of the like caused injury in this area? I can't identify the specific tool type, but it was something with a small surface area, such as a, um, a beveled edge or a point. Okay. And a tool mark examiner would be the person who might try to identify what object would do that. Yes. The procedure in my agency is the anthropologist identifies the location and general nature of sharp traumas, and that's then forwarded to our uh, 
firearms and tool marks unit for additional analysis. Okay. Now, let me show you just for reference, it states Exhibit 182B, which is a close-up of that area. Okay. Could you again point to us the area that where you saw the trauma? Yes. So this is the right anominate or right hip bone and the left side and the sacrum in the middle. Okay. Thank you. Now, um, did you document the injuries that you saw? Yes, I documented the sharp alterations that I observed. Okay. All right, let's start with um, your item 16. And let me show you States Exhibit 181C. Do you recognize that? Yes, that is a photograph that I took during my examination, um, annotated with numbered indicators of the sharp alterations. And those annotations were put in there by who? I added those. Okay. And I know you answered defense counsel's question, but since it's in front of us, why did you enter those annotations? So just to make it clear in my documentation and report where these alterations were located, also because these two photographs are taken from two different views and numbering them helps to clarify that some of them can be visualized on both sides of the bone. Okay. When you say visualized on both sides of the bone, that means the, the front side and the back side? Yes. Okay. Uh, and how many um, areas of um, sharp trauma did you identify? On item 16, which is the left anominate, there were five sharp traumas. Okay. Okay. Uh, are these um, type of traumas consistent with something happen, happening inside of her, like a disease or a natural process? No. Okay. Why not? Um, a disease process uh, affects the bone in a much different way. So a disease might um, cause the bone to react or respond to that disease by, for example, depositing um, what we call woven or a very loosely organized bone that results in a weakened area of bone. Um, a disease process might also affect an entire bone or the entire skeleton, for example, in a, in a loss of bone density. Um, in this case, what's seen are alterations to the bone from an external force with no evidence of that um, response or remodeling. Okay. When you say an external force, something or someone penetrated and pierced this bone? This, yes, this was an external force imposed on the bone. Now, um, have you had experience in looking at bodies that have been dismembered? Yes. Okay. Is there, are there areas when a body is dismembered where you expect to see issues that are, um, or injuries um, as evidence of dismemberment? Typically, sharp traumas in dismemberment cases occur around joints. So when you say around joints, what does that mean? Um, around parts of the limbs and body that join together. So for example, where the arms or legs or head meet the torso. Okay, so the injury, the five sharp instrument injuries that we see in your item 16 on the exhibit before you, um, are these all evidence of uh, dismemberment? These would not be typical of dismemberment. Okay, um, what are they typical of? Um, I can't say exactly what sort of action or implement caused them, but that some sort of external small surface area object impacted the bones. So why do you say they are not consistent with an, um, in, consistent with other injuries you've seen it for dismemberment? Um, because these do not appear, to, these aren't near joints. So typically dismemberment, the objective is to break the body into smaller portions. Um, and that's why the joints tend to be targeted. Um, in this case, all of these um, sharp traumas are in the area of the pelvic region. So you said in the area of the pelvic region. So for reference, if I may, let's use States Exhibit 182B again. Could you point to us what you're talking about? So the sharp traumas were all found on the anominates or the, the hip bones here. 
as well as part of the left side of the sacrum. And some of the sharp traumas um, are, can be visualized on both sides of the bone because it went all the way through. So it would be on, on the back side that you can't see here. Okay. So it's more on the side um, that would be interior of the body and not exterior? Yes. Okay. You referenced earlier with defense counsel having taken x-rays and um, CT scans of item 16. Let me show you state's exhibit 181D. Do you recognize it? Yes, these are two-dimensional screen captures of a three-dimensional CT scan that I created of item 16. Okay. And why did you do that? Uh, using CT scans helps to better visualize um, traumas or other features that might be useful for, in other cases, for identification purposes. Okay. And um, do you see some of the um, sharp trauma um, items that you've discussed reflected in these CT scans? Yes. Can you point those out to us, please? Yes. So some of them are, I, I don't know which numbers these are because this isn't an annotated one, but one example is here, another here, um, there's another here, and one here. Okay. And what about the lower ones? Can you see them there? Um, this, um, this one does not visualize them very well. That setting didn't, but I do see sharp traumas here, here, another here, and another here. Okay. The one lower, um, where in the body is the one that's lower, typically located? Uh, are you talking about this one right here? Yes, ma'am. Um, this is on the top of the pubis. Um, if you wanted to show the skeleton diagram, I could point that out there, but it's basically the, the front part of the pelvis. And um, for the record, I'm showing 182. Let me use the large one. Let me do 182B, Your Honor. All right. And Ms. Smith, we're drawing right up to our time to adjourn for the day, if you'd like to figure out a logical breaking point here soon. Um, may I do this one and one more picture, and then we'll be on to another object? Yes. Thank you, Judge. Um, and you were saying you asked to see this. Where Where is that area of the pubis? Yes, that previously indicated sharp trauma was approximately in this region. Okay. And um, it just for orientation for those of us who, who it, how is that by your belly button? Is that by your uterus? Understanding everyone's different, but general region. Yes, so that's going to be below the belly button in the pubic region. Okay. And is that particular... Um, Injury, sharp injury, consistent with dismemberment or inconsistent with dismemberment? That's inconsistent with what's typically seen in dismemberment. And um, we have one more set of, of close-ups of the sharp uh, trauma in this area. Item 16 reflected in states 181E. Can you explain to us what we're looking at 181A? Yes, these are detail or close-up views of the same alterations depicted in the other photograph and CT scans. Okay. When you say these, there are four pictures? Yes. Okay. And there are numbers on the pictures? I don't. I can't tell how well that shows up on other people's monitors. Yes. Does it show up? These, these are annotated also with the numbers corresponding to the numbers in the other image. Okay. So the numbers in each of the items for item 16 all match each other, even if they're different shots? Yes, exactly. Okay. And so there's an image of um, number 4, number 3, number 1, and number 2 and 3? Yes, and also the upper left one um, depicts an additional view of number 4. Okay. And those are all on the left side? <laughs> Correct. This is item 16, so yes, uh, let me just verify. Yes, these are all on the left hip bone. Okay. Um, we're done with this view, Judge. I can start up with item 19 tomorrow. Okay. All right. Thank you, Judge. All right. Thank you, Ms. Smith. All right. We will uh, recess for the day then. I'll admonish the jury again, please, as you go home tonight.
don't talk about the case amongst yourselves or with anyone else. Please don't do any research into the case. Don't view any media coverage of the case. Uh, follow the case at all anywhere that would impair your ability to be impartial in this case as you've continued to do so up to this point. Uh, I appreciate you doing that every day. The parties as well appreciate your continued service. And so with that, we will adjourn for the day and plan on commencing again tomorrow morning at 8.30. All right, please.